Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Very excited to see the amount of folks that have turned out this evening. My name is Ron Vecchio, your town council president, and we're going to resume a meeting that we started at 6.30 with a acceptance of the minutes of the March 20th meeting. Motion to accept. I have a motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. And the first order of business that we could not postpone because we had already advertised it was a public hearing for the town council to fund $142,100 for 25% design engineering for the town of Winthrop Revere Street TIP project. And we had a meeting earlier this evening. Do I hear a motion to postpone this? Uh... I think we should open the... Okay, we'll open the hearing. Motion to continue the hearing to the next town council meeting. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So here we are. The official business is done. And we'll get right down to brass tacks. This new council has been together for 92 days or 93 days, I believe it was. 93 days ago, we met in this very room to take our oath of office. And there are several major projects that have been ongoing for the last couple of years that are very, very important to the future of the community. And we thought that we, instead of just having a you know, public comment period, as we do in every town council meeting, we felt it appropriate to offer this up as a form very similar to the old town meeting, where everybody had an opportunity once a year to come in and get a lot of things off their chest. Tonight, there's three items on the agenda for this forum, just three. Any other situation or any other subject that you want to bring up, I ask you to wait until after this forum is over and you can bring it up under public comment at the end of the meeting, okay? We want to stick just to the agenda. We also would ask that you keep your comments down to three minutes. We have a lot of folks here this evening. I assume a lot of people want to express their feelings about these projects. So it's only fair that we keep to three minutes. Denise, do you have the three minute clock? Okay. So with that, I, the first item on the public forum is the Center Business District. And to give us an overview, I'll call on uh, Stephen Calla and Chief Tullahanty. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Steve Keller. I am the uh, Director of Public Works for the Town of Winthrop. I've been asked to come here tonight and speak on the Center Business District Infrastructure Improvement Project. The Center Business District was last upgraded nearly 30 years ago under the former Selectman form of government. The photos on the screen depict the current conditions of the area. At that time, although some traffic safety issues were addressed and a facelift was given to the hardscape within the business district, primarily around the French Square area, only minor upgrades were made to the water mains and no notable upgrades were made to either the sewer or drainage systems in this area. Since that project was completed in the early 90s, businesses have come and gone, but grease-generating restaurants have seemed to increase, many of which had operated for years prior to the town's adoption of the grease trap ordinance, and thus prior to any real enforcement of the proper maintenance of this equipment. This grease has caused major stress to the already failing sewer infrastructure in this area. Furthermore, the drainage challenges that existed during the 90s project have only increased through the years as pipes and structures continue to age. Each year that has passed has provided data-supported events such as sewer backups and flooding that will only be corrected by a full replacement of the underground utilities, which are nearly all original to this day, minus several emergency spot repairs that occurred throughout the years. The new zoning allowances and the recent adoption of the CBD master plan, which was created to attract developers to an area that is barely being supported by this very tired and aged infrastructure, 
has created a situation that demands immediate attention and action. The CBD Infrastructure Improvement Project is being designed to improve these deficiencies and to enable the town to attract developers to an area that will support the growth that the town is seeking. So this brings me to the real reason I've, I've been asked to come here tonight, to help shed some light on this project and to answer the question, how did this project become a $12.5 million project? Well, the answer is quite simple. The many requests and input from the prior administration, the former and current town council, and the many residents that participated in the community engagement forums have expanded the initial scope and limits to a $12.5 million project. This project has more than doubled in size, quantity, and amenities from the initial sewer rehabilitation project that was first being proposed in 2016. The slide that's up on the board is a graphic summary of the evolution of the project and shows the significant expansion of design and scope that corresponded to the many revisions of construction estimates that were presented to the community for the last two years. The initial design contract request from 2016 was to address sewer infrastructure deficiencies that were identified as far back as 2007 and added to the capital improvement plan in 2008. The design proposed approximately 2,400 linear feet of sewer main improvements and was to be funded in part through an MWRA finance assistance program. This long-awaited design contract was fueled in 2016 by an increase in local developers' inquiries and reiterated by the Center Business District Master Plan process and the Economic Advisory Committee that the age and condition of the underground utilities within the CBD were a major barrier to redevelopment in this area. The improvements proposed were to replace the failing sewer infrastructure that is misaligned, inundated with grease, and poorly pitched, and to properly size the sewer mains for increased capacity and in preparation of anticipated development within the town center. These initial improvements depicted in green up on the screen were limited to Woodside Avenue, from Pauline Street to French Square, Hagman Road, Somerset Avenue from Woodside Avenue to Cottage Park Road, and Bartlett Road from Woodside Avenue to Adams Street. In January 2017, the town modified the initial request, still depicted in green, and asked for an estimate for the replacement and upgrade of all three utilities, changing the project from a sewer only to a water, sewer, and drainage project. The project limits remain the same, with the exception that Pauline Street from Woodside Avenue to Putnam Street be added to the original scope. This request was made to support a grant opportunity the town was pursuing, and which we ultimately secured for $2.38 million. Improvements under the modified design request now included approximately 2,400 linear feet of sewer main improvements, 2,100 linear feet of drainage improvements, stormwater best management practices to reduce pollutants potentially discharging to Donovan's Beach, 900 linear feet of water main improvements, 10,600 linear feet of sidewalk improvements, curb to curb asphalt restoration, replacement of existing decorative street lights, and new benches and trash receptacles. The total value of this expanded scope was estimated at $3,213,000. In March 2017, the town amended the project once again to include converting Hagman Road into a pedestrian way and altering the layout and traffic patterns in French Square. These improvements, depicted in yellow, included alterations to traffic patterns in French Square and Hagman Road, creating pedestrian ways and green space on Hagman Road, expanding green space, reconfiguring French Square, and providing either a fountain or gazebo in French Square, the addition of a new flagpole, and the addition of walkways and benches, also configuring the parking stall layout in the town parking lot adjacent to Citizens Bank due to the new pedestrian way being proposed on Hagman Road. 
and designing lighting improvements along Hagman Road and French Square, including the installation of new underground conduits to power the new lighting. The project estimate for this portion of the expanded project, labeled by the design team as phase one, which was the green and yellow highlighted areas of the prior slide, was now increased to $5.9 million based on these changes. At this time, the town also met with National Grid Electric and shortly thereafter entered into an engineering contract to begin design work to remove the overhead wires and transformers at the entrance to the Center Business District at, Wo at Woodside Ave near Pauline Street, right at CVS, current CVS, to underground utilities. This work, separate from the prior estimate, would add another estimated $500,000 to the project. Shortly after requesting revisions to Hagman Road and French Square, the town expanded the project limits once again. This new expansion is depicted in blue. This expansion nearly doubled the project area and scope. The expanded area was proposed to be constructed as a second phase and included water, sewer, and drain improvements on Woodside Avenue from French Square to Pleasant Street, Adams Street, William Street, Bartlett Road from Adams Street to Pleasant, Cottage Park Road, and Somerset Avenue from Cottage Park Road to Pleasant Street. This additional work in phase two was estimated at $3.5 million. Again, phase one was estimated at 5.9 million, bringing us to a $9.4 million project at this time, construction only. There was then a period where the scope and construction strategy fluctuated greatly. Multiple renderings were developed for the layout of the new pedestrian way in French Square. The town then requested phase one and phase two be combined to one all-inclusive project, then requested it be separated back to two projects, and eventually both phases were returned to a single all-inclusive project scope to shorten the impact duration and to lessen the cost of multiple construction phases. So at this point, our limits have grown from that green portion that began in 2016 to the entire highlighted area that you see on the screen. In addition to the expanded scope and limits that I've already covered, reclaim and paving of the parking lot known as Hagman Extension next to French Square was added to the project. At the request of council, a peer review of the design was completed and supported by Coughlin Environmental. After this peer review was finalized and a traffic study was conducted, the town then decided not to convert Hagman Road to a pedestrian way, and drainage structures needed to be reconfigured and redrawn on the construction plans to accommodate a vehicular way. Finally, at the request of certain members of the council, CBA, our landscape architect, was hired to design landscape architectural improvements to French Square, also to the town parking lot, to Hagman Road, and miscellaneous locations throughout the phase one area which is the, the green shaded area on the screen. Uh, the landscape architect coverage is depicted in the, in the red brick pattern. I don't know if, if it's that easy to see up there. But that, that's what the town asked the architect to, to, to make their improvements, or where the town asked the architect to make their improvements. Then in response to the flooding that resulted from the historic rain event in the summer of 2017, the town requested drainage improvements be extended to Jefferson Street to include the intersection of Putnam Street and extending drainage improvements approximately 100 linear feet past this intersection in the, in the uh, direction of Fremont Street. As design and engineering progressed, it became apparent that a $900,000 contingency needed to be added to the project to remove and dispose of contaminated soils and to treat and discharge contaminated groundwater that may be encountered during construction at several known releases in underground storage tank locations within the project limits. 
Under the leadership of the acting town manager, a contingency of $1.5 million was finally added to the project to account for construction administration and police details that would be associated with the project. Although this was a known expense continuously raised as a funding concern by the design team throughout the process, the previous town manager ch chose to communicate construction estimates only. The councilor requested landscape architect's estimate came in at $700,000. So it's these additional changes, the landscape improvements, and the three contingencies which increased the project estimate to $12.5 million. Hopefully that clarifies how we got to where we are and dismisses any rumors that the project was inaccurately engineered or estimated. So where do we go from here? Well, we can choose to do nothing. We can return all grants. We can retract all council appropriations previously voted for the project and continue to apply band-aids to the failing infrastructure in this business district and accept the reality that it simply will not support new growth, or we can choose to move forward. If we choose to move forward, what are our options? Well, we can scale down the project and bring it back to a utility-only upgrade with new asphalt in the affected areas and leave all other amenities and upgrades for a future project. These critically needed and impressive, and impressive upgrades will certainly support development and will accommodate the full potential of the new zoning allowances, but won't be nearly as, as, as aesthetically pleasing to the eye and could lessen the attraction to developers. That's a decision for the community, that's a decision for the council, but it's an option. Or we can choose to construct the proposed all-inclusive project for the $12.5 million and create a business district that is equally attractive as it is well-built. Again, it's a decision for the community, it's a decision for the council. I await a decision on how we want to proceed and I will make sure that whatever we choose will be built properly and will support everything I described down the Senate Business District. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Chief, I was wondering if we could get a breakdown of cost estimates, what it would cost the average taxpayer in different phases, whether we go to the full-blown project or we go to the bare bones. Sure, the uh, $9.5 million project would cost a uh, general fund $84,000 um, a year uh, over the next 30 years. Um, that would not, um, I, would, I would suggest to the council that that be managed within the budget and not uh, at that exclusion. If we chose to do the $12.5 million project, is $345,000 a year for the next 30 years. Um, and that would have to, um, we could not sustain that in the general fund on the new growth or the current tax rate. Okay, at this time I'll open it up to comments. Uh, there's microphones at the base of the stairs. I would ask if you'd like to speak to state your name and your precinct and the microphones are open. Precinct five. Um, got a number of questions. Uh, number one, um, I, underst I understand that the uh, scope has grown, but when you're looking at water, sewer, and stormwater uh, runoff, they operate as a system. So it's not surprising to me as a layman that the scope needed to expand to include everything that's there today. Not surprising at all. I want to know why it was surprising to our engineers in our town. To me, that's unacceptable. I'd like to know the history of the engineer that we hired. Did we go through a competitive process? What was their original scope? What was their original budget? And how has that grown over time? And I uh, want to make sure that we're not being taken advantage of by anybody. And I think the public should see all, those, all that data. I also 
still don't see, despite having asked it at a number of public meetings, a construction phasing plan. We talk about the age of the mainline water, sewer, and drainage systems. All those systems have a variety of houses and businesses that tie into them. If the main line is old, I can tell you that tie-ins are even older, which means that you're going to have to dig up a substantial amount of the sidewalk, which means you're going to take access to homes and businesses. It means you're going to compromise parking at different points, which means that the only way to survive the process is to have a construction phasing plan that restricts the contractor's work so that we can survive and continue to live if we live in that district or do business if we do business in that district. When you have a construction phasing plan and you tell a contractor how to do their work, the cost estimate will change. And I worry that the cost estimate we have today is not at all accurate because we do not have a detailed construction phasing plan that faces the reality of the amount of excavation we need to do. I also think that any analysis of how to pay for this ought to be placed in writing in detail rather than verbally because I certainly didn't understand what was offered by the town manager on that. I make one last comment, which is this town had an opportunity at the front end, if it had done things right, to ask for more money in the MassWorks application, that $3 million, we're so proud to have gotten the 2.7 million. I think if we can get our act together and show the history of how this happened in detail with the documents from the engineering firm and other town planning documents and pull together a project management plan that is very clear about construction phasing, about completion of the engineering, that we should go back to the state and see if we can have a second round, second bite at the MassWorks application. Because I know other cities and towns get significantly more than $3 million for significant elements. The last piece I will say is after living through what is going to be a very, and I think this work needs to be done, by the way, after living through what is going to be a very difficult couple of years, we deserve to understand in detail what the surface restoration is going to look like. And all we have is a vague plan. I think that needs to be shared with the community in detail. I think the community should be in a position to review it. And I want to make sure that the engineer is overseeing and taking responsibility for the work of the landscape architect. So we don't have two separate designers pointing fingers at each other during the construction period, because that'll lead to change orders and claims and more money. So that's my list of Initial reaction to all this, and I hope the council would take that seriously. Anyone else? Yes. Just, Mr. President, before we continue, a lot of these documents are on our website. The financial analysis of the Senate Business District is on the website um, on the project's plans and presentations. The engineering at uh, Mr. Aiello's request has been posted to the website as well. Um, so there's a lot of these reports and documents are existing currently today on the website. Senate Business District financial analysis plan is, is there. Um, so I just want to make sure that um, people out there that want to go look on the website can, and a lot of those reports are, the 9.5 million will be added um, as an addendum to that report. Thank you. Yes. I'd just like to give you an amendment. When you go on that new site, she scrolls and rolls. She doesn't stay stable. So if you wanted to say stop at one page and print that specific page out. So you might want to double check it. Some of us old timers are not as technically savvy on how to stop it. I'm with you. I'll let Larissa know. She does all the websites. So. <laughs> uh, mine is more in the way of a um, walk down memory lane. Back when I was visiting in Winthrop, there was a big to-do about, they were putting in the bricks, the French Square was going to be modernized, and we were all excited. And I had the opportunity back in 99, 98, to buy in Winthrop and move here and become active. And as a town meeting member, I felt we at least had, with the Red Book, we had the opportunity to look at the bills. We had an opportunity to have much more in the way of ongoing knowledge. Not that it was always successful, but at least it was there. Many of our council members today sit there and have been part of the new government from its inception. There was one gentleman on the board that I would like to commend, and that's Mr. Christopher. He has the decency and the dignity 
to go to his constituents within his precinct and to keep them informed. And I think the onus of responsibility lies with each and every one of you as you went and solicited the votes, as you went and sent out your mailings, you could have been keeping us abreast of how the needs were coming about, how you were going to be hiring people. The first indication that most of us got was, we want a place to walk and open land down in the center. We want to close Hagman Road. And that's when everybody sat up and started to take note. Prior to that, it seemed like it was a special little <coughs> private good old boys club, if you will. So I have a request. When you have these things coming, don't rely. <laughs> don't rely on just having me go to my computer and, and do my old grandma walking through, OK? Go, to your go into your uh, constituents. Go into your precinct. And if you don't want to have a meeting or you can't take the time to have a meeting, at least send up a periodic outdate of what you feel the town needs and how you're supporting it and how you're going to ask us taxpayers to support you. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> Frank Costantino. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Frank Costantino, Precinct 2. Um, I wanted to uh, address uh, quite a lengthy uh, report in response to some of the things that I've been party to uh, in the past few months. Uh, but um, I only have a few minutes to deal with at least this section having to do with the center area. Uh, anyway, I'm going to read from some prepared notes. Uh, I've been pleased to participate in a number of review sessions and council meetings for the plan, plans for Winthrop Center in French Square. Despite apparent progress on the project, it appears that the driving forces in pursuing a developing course for the town has brought us to a harsh awakening of unanticipated increased financial costs that may have to be unfairly carried by all the town's 18,000 residents, and which expense may have been the result of the expanded scope of work. More importantly, to the core of what our town could and should be, not decided just by councillors, but involving all residents, needs to be determined by what kind of town we want. Toward a possible course of improvement, Winthrop has the golden opportunity to brand itself in the jargon of today. What do we think of when we envision Winthrop? Is it the ocean with our eight miles or so of surrounding waters and our many beaches? It is at our red, white, and blue water tower that thousands of people see when they fly into Logan? Is it the 400-year-old Dean Winthrop House and its 105-year-old Strawberry Festival, the narrow gauge railroad history, the 4th of July parade, the center, the restaurants, shops, yacht and social clubs, or the views to the city in its quiet, safe neighborhoods. As a town, who are we? How do we utilize these and many other unique aspects of this community to undertake any development that will collectively reinforce rather than diminish these very distinctive features? Collectively, all these elements are part and parcel of the intangibles, an atmosphere that define the character of a town and must be key factors in establishing a vision for reshaping our town. And these very intangibles make all the difference in how we live. Russ Sanford, former president of the council, in his departing remarks from a long service on the council, stated that, and I quote, Winthrop is just a different place, a small town atmosphere, and everyone knows everybody, which can be good and bad sometimes, but that's one of the benefits of living in a small town. People pull for each other, people need to really come together and step up for each other here, end of quote. As a driving force behind the proposed center district project, the current developer's tempting package might seem to solve some of the financial concerns for raising projected revenues for the town, but it costs implications that have not been or hastily thought through by the town council. A developer's job is to alter desirable areas for profit, but not necessarily concerning themselves what may be best for the overall community or their project's longer lasting impacts. With a proposed increase to the now tolerable density in the center area, I am to understand that the developers, in fact, have previously undertaken or manipulated favorable changes to our zoning bylaws and lobbied for municipally paid alterations to our utility service so that they can develop, or cram may be a better word, mostly housing users to bring even greater and wanted, unwanted dens density to saturated center district. The result of such a course would be numerous unforeseen lo logistical problems in serving a built up densely congested area. I think this direction and degree of proposed development would come at a very dear and irreversible cost our town cannot afford. It seems a scattershot approach, I suggest. As far as French Square itself, 
It has not been maintained well enough. With hands-on care from the original beautification committee members for 15 years, some of the elements did have to be done by the town. This park was handmade and, it is, distinct, and it is a distinctive element of this community. No one else has anything like it. It represents the effort, funds, and participation from a wide spectrum of residents with its signed plaques in the walkway, on the benches, on the narrow gauge monument, and French Square has character, and it's also named for one of our armed servicemen. Despite the careful attentions of capable designers, the new design is sterile and characterless and removes what is now a unique place into something utilitarian and like everywhere else. And I wonder if we are not destroying French Square to save it. I contend that instead of our destroying the square, its area could and should be somewhat expanded. Its durable finishing, furnishings could be refreshed or renewed, and it won't cost us millions of dollars, for which we'll be paying for a very long time. Sponsors were subsequently to take care of beautification sites, but perhaps a, a partnership of maintenance for this signature asset, sustained somewhat by beautification committee sponsors, who can only do so much, now should be done seasonally and regularly by the town, and not every 30 years. We're talking about space, color, scale, proportion, movement, experiences, emotional refreshment, wayfinding, signage. These are some of the design intangibles that are practical, essential components of an inviting quality of environment, either personal or collective. The cost for center improvements has increased by $4 million or so, and perhaps more, based on Mr. Caller's presentation. Our current collective liabilities for the town's expenses which includes the published salaries of our public service workers at the, the fire department, the police department, the DPW, and the schools, and not to mention further pensions and benefits for retirees may, not, may also be increased further. With the current plans, we might be on the verge of being confronted with something like a reverse mortgage in that developers have initiated strong proposals for changes that will inevitably alter and change the value of the town, not only in the center, but as a whole, such a mortgage would leave all residents holding the bag of increased municipal costs when the borrowed account runs out and for a very long time after developers have left or sold out for profits. How can the town council justify burdening the town residents with such increased costs? I would not want to sign away my future or that of my family or fellow residents for such a condition. What our town really needs first is not developers' moneyed visions of what they see as feasible for them, but what the town can strongly establish as the collective vision for the town. And I don't believe we have that vision yet in place. Upon taking office, our new but deeply experienced council president, Mr. Vecchia, has stated, and I quote, he has hopes that a new town manager, Mr. Delahanty, shares the mission of our citizens and elected officials to respect our history, to be open to the ideas and desires of all the residents. It'll be paramount that the new manager provide an open process, process that addresses neighborhood concerns of critical issues. Ron also stated, and I quote, that we can formulate a master plan that addresses future developments town-wide if we are to broaden our tax base and avoid overrides or debt exclusions to fund the cost of capital improvements, end of quote. We all trust that the town council president and his associates will be honoring that intent. We know the town council has our implied trust for deciding on what the vision should be, and I'm far from assured that there is yet an acceptable vision for our town with which most residents feel comfortable or confident with some following ideas, which are posted on a website, uh, and I will direct people to that. I suggest that there are numerous criteria that should be more carefully addressed and brought before our residents before realizing a broader, more agreeable outlook of what we want our town to be. This will and should take more time and engagement from many diverse parties. For what we do now, our children and grandchildren will inherit. I would sincerely hope it would not be an empty bag of reverse mortgage with neighborhoods that recreate a Chelsea or East Boston or other crammed, indistinct, characterless city environment. What I think we would all want is to maintain a sense of community, the stability of a distinct lifestyle, and not an intrusive fix seriously impacting our community. What I think we would all want is to bring visitors to our town to experience what we have here. And they could come by ferry for eight bucks, or by the T, or by Uber, or by bike, or in their electric vehicles, and enjoy our town, and leave, a good, leave with a good experience and some enjoyment, but leave us with all their dollars. The Antique Table, Aaliyah's, Belle Isle Seafood are excellent recent examples of appealing places where visitors leave their money, as has the Winter Arms for decades. And these visitors will and do keep coming back. And we should do much more of this with other businesses in town. How many of us have traveled to Rockport for art, for music, for a quaint seaside village experience to look at motif number one and return the richer, the more relaxed and refreshed for the visit? 
How many have gone to Agunquit just to walk the marginal way, visit the Potion Stamp Center and restaurants at Perkins Cove, and come back having this refreshing breath of their seaside community? And what do you hear on the streets? Many French-speaking visitors from Montreal and Canada, as well as a huge mix of visitor types. I'm working on an expansive project along Boston's Overlook waterfront, whose objective is to enhance mile-long sections of this harbor's waterfront along Commercial Street in the North End, as well as in East Boston, in a way that has not been done before. It will create dimensions and attractions, destinations and attractions that will celebrate the shipping, the fishing, and the undiscovered history of maritime that has been overlooked and uncelebrated for four centuries in our city. This and other projects I've worked on having been presented also to Speaker DeLeo and Senator Boncori. I'll be done in a moment. We want some of the millions of visitors who swarm Boston for its history and many attractions to take a ferry, come to Winthrop, walk our streets and seaside, spend their handy disposable dollars and leave with a satisfying, refreshing feeling that we get when we visit other places. We have travelers from all over the country and around the world that pass through our airport to visit Boston. Why not have folks from Paris, London, Tokyo, Dublin come to Winthrop for a visit? I can imagine that very easily and some of that is happening now with visitors to our small inns like the Harrington House in Crystal Cove. Rockport, Salem, Marblehead, Ogunquit, and other close places of appeal are examples of thriving and unique places, and Winthrop can and should be one of those places. Winthrop should evaluate and make its unique assets even more appealing to invite and welcome visitors to the town, spend their money, and enjoy spending it in the process. We have Viking Pride helping big time to support the school's athletic programs. We should also have Winthrop Pride that could help support the making of our town, a pride of people that can help support the DPW workers who are our neighbors, the business owners who are our friends, our children who are raising our grandchildren and need, who need all manner of things close at hand, the newcomers to, uh, the, that come to town who also want to raise their families, and our elected representatives, not only here but thankfully also in the State House, who want to see a swelling winter pride manifest itself in some sensible yet economical improvements to our community. I implore the council and especially our newest and youngest councilors to research and be familiar with the incredible resources at their disposal and listed on the website I referred to earlier that outlines successful ways to better our community from our collective vision and not some developer's idea of cramming in projects where they do not need to be. I hope to speak Thank to you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Mr. Lasola. Good evening. I, I would just like to speak from experience being a business owner down the center. Um, for a year and a half, myself and many of the business owners down the center went to a monthly meeting held by the town manager and the council president or one of the councilors at the time. For a year and a half, we talked about the center redevelopment, what was going on. At the end of every meeting, we'd ask, where's the money coming from? The answer was, don't worry, we have plenty of money. Every single meeting ended the same way. And now it's a little disheartening to find out that, no, we don't have the money. And I realize the figures were fact-checked and given to the town manager at the time, and I don't understand why no one on the council spoke up and said, we don't have the money for this. We need to backtrack. We need to get something more realistic. So it just, for myself and some of the other business owners, we're losing faith in our government as far as governing and, and leading us like we expected when you were voted into councilorship. Um, the other thing is, I've looked at that dilapidated building across the street from my building for 10 years now. It needs to be developed. And if needs infrastructure underneath here and underneath the whole center needs to be fixed. Myself and just about every business owner in the center has experienced sewer backups. In the end of January, early February, there were three in one week. And it's a weekly sight to see the truck down there blowing out the sewers because there's another backup and it just cannot continue. So if this needs to be scaled back to something reasonable or whatever, it just has to be done. And then my last comment is, um, if you watch TV, things are ripped from the headlines. Well, here's something ripped from the headlines back in September and October. The center flooded. Every business down there had one or two feet of water in their basement because of the poor drainage. So again, something needs to be done. It doesn't have to be a massive project, but something has to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucerto. Yes. Precinct 6. 
I'm not against the revitalizing of the center. However, I am against the scale of the project. I believe we can accomplish a nice looking center and have expandability down there without such a high price tag. We had supposed grants to cover the cost. Now we have the possibility of overrides and loans from mass water. That will increase our water bills and our taxes. We aren't even paying for the increases of the school field yet. Most Winthrop residents can't keep supporting these increases. This project was, <clears throat> this project was also, ch uh, would change uh, the small town feel to feel more like Somerville or Cambridge, which I'm not okay with. And most people that I speak to aren't either. In the beginning, this was supposed to be a simple infrastructure project and has transformed into a major undertaking and was said to be for the businesses and to help them. It's clearly not for the businesses, as no one has ever come around to, uh, and asked them what will work for their business. In fact, it has spoken to actually remove some of the businesses down there due they don't fit into the plan of a small group of people or investors. Businesses and residents are not included in this process. Yes, there were meetings that were largely empty, as I, I attended most of them over the last year and a half. Then the closing of Hagman Road is what woke people up as to what is going on. You have multiple res residences and businesses feeling bullied and feel there is nothing they can do nor have any say in the process. And when they do say something, they feel it was a waste of time as they don't feel like they're being listened to. I was <clears throat> told multiple times everyone was spoken to, but everyone I spoke to was not asked or confronted for their input. The majority I speak to are not for the scale of this project. It will have a huge impact on the quality of life for the residences and the normal business flow for businesses down the center for years why these projects take place. Unfortunately, you will have a lot of people avoiding the center due to this, due to this project as people were avoiding the center just when Hagman Road was closed. That is not fair to the residents, nor, nor is fair to the businesses. It's just too deep of an impact for all of us. When this discussion of the master plan came about, we were told it was to get people talking and it can and will be changed at any time to fit what the people of Winthrop wanted. It seems that the town is moving full steam ahead for the actual master plan that was adopted by the last council. People are talking and are speaking out and we all need to be listened to because there is a small group of people that want it and a major group that does not. I'm not saying not to clean up the center and make it pretty and fix the infrastructure that needs fixing for the proper drainage. I think most people agree that would be great, but we do need, but we do not need to be overshadowing our neighbors with four-story buildings and ruining the flourishing businesses we do have down the center that serve our community well. We don't need to create tax and water bill burden to the whole town for the center business project of this scale. That is, that is only going to benefit the venture capitalists. Thank you for your time. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Dawn. <clears throat> work from precinct three, I don't know if this works. Um, I just have some questions and comments that I wrote down while, um, I think this is not on. I'm just gonna talk real close. Testing, okay, sorry, yeah, thank you. So I just have some questions, I'm Dawn from precinct three. I just have some questions and comments. Um, the $700,000 for the landscape design, was that bid out? Um, who is on the design team and who is the project manager for the project? Paying a project manager still requires an in-house manager to oversee it, watch the budgets, and ensure that the work is done to spec. I see Steve Callow's name listed on a lot of projects, but he's running the DPW, so that doesn't seem like that can be done both well. And is it a maintenance issue for the storm center, sewers slash drains? Is it the drains or is it the sewers? And if it's the same thing, I thought that 20 years ago, towns were supposed to be separating their sewers from their drains. And I guess someone else mentioned sort of a vision for the project. I mean, what is the outcome and the bang for the buck of this project in relationship to the rest of the town? Because we need a firehouse now and the town's resilience, climate resiliency report on the website lists um, priority sites that need to be taken care of in order for the town to survive climate change. So I, I would just caution the town to um, you know, prioritize projects because how many times can you get an override? Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Jim Murray, Precinct 6. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Calla, for putting that together. Uh, that's quite enlightening to show where it was and where it is now. And it looks like that the previous town manager and councilors underbid the cost in order to have a lower cost on a piece of paper so that we would be lulled into a false sense of security. When I don't know how you can have a project that size and not have police details. I'm not an engineer, but even I know that. That's very disappointing for the counselors that were on there because it seems like something was afoot. Pass it quickly, move it along before anyone realizes the scopes have changed dramatically and the cost has risen, risen, risen. And then Mr. Keller was, I think, hung out the dry when the cost went from four million to 12 and a half million with no corresponding explanation. Everyone was saying he misbid it. No, look at that colored slide. It looks like we're building a brand new town. That's great if you have the money. Our friends, our families are floating away in some parts of our town. We don't have anything on the board to fix that, I don't believe. We need to economize as much as we can on this center project. Mr. Lacerdo's right. We need to fix the stuff that needs to be fixed. But this pie in the sky stuff, $12.5 million, so that some developer can swoop in and build a four-story building, and then a year and a half leave, I don't understand. I read the news every day. Chelsea, everyone wanted to be like them. Now they're screaming for moratoriums on building because everyone went there, everyone built. And now the people that have stayed, because the developers are gone, they're like, wow, what did we get into? So I heard someone say, we need to take our time. And some people would say, we've taken too much time already. I would say that we move too fast. And that's why we're in the trouble we're in at the moment with getting the grants too early before the entire town was on board. I watched a lot of those meetings. I've attended a lot of these meetings. And everything was vote now, vote now, hurry up, previous town manager. That was his previous saying, and along with the previous town council president, we got to vote now, we got to do it right away, or we're going to lose the money, we can't afford to lose the money. Everything was about the money. You don't spend 12 and a half million so that you can get a break on two and a half million. We need to do what we can afford. That may not be what everybody wants, but that's the reality of the situation. All of us know, we live within our budgets. You need a new car, you want to buy a house, you can't buy whatever you want, you got to buy what you can afford. And then you make do, you make changes, you make improvements. But I think you're hearing from the town, the constituents, remember? You guys are trusted. We voted for you. We expect you to keep us in mind. It's the town's vision. You're there to help us, to shepherd us. It's not your vision. It's our vision. It's our town. It's not your town. And I just hope you keep that in mind when you're deliberating on this particular project. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sacco. Thank you. Todd Sacco, Precinct 2. <clears throat> My comments are actually for, the, for us as voters and citizens, for the people watching and who may watch this meeting back. It's very clear that uh, we're in need of some money. And uh, in November, we have an opportunity to change the direction of the town of Winthrop, where we're going to be voting on a dispensary. And I know there are, it's not popular with a lot of people in this town, but you owe it to those of us who do support it to at least do your homework. Go visit one in Brookline. See the people who go in there. Compare it to who you sit next to at your yacht clubs and in the locker rooms of those yacht clubs. Look at its impact on the financial outlook for those communities that it's in and its impact on the opioid crisis. You might be surprised. Thank you. Okay. 
Junior? Julia Wallers, Precinct 2. I actually just have a couple of quick comments and then a short statement to read from someone who couldn't be here tonight, if that's okay. They're both very brief. Um, uh, first, I want to just really commend you on taking the steps to open up transparency to have this meeting, all, even though sometimes it feels like we're chasing our tail because some of us have been to a lot of meetings and we think, God, we're talking about the same thing over and over again. But clearly, there is a deep-rooted sense of... Um, like exclusion from what's going on in government in this town, and I'm very happy that this council and President Vecca that you're addressing this by having meetings like this. And I do love the idea of um, each councilor doing meetings like what Councilor Christopher has been doing, you know, direct door-to-door -door in the neighborhoods, precinct-specific stuff. I think that makes a really big difference because it's, it's hard for people to understand, to support what they don't understand. So this is all part of the process of coming to understand what is going on, right? Um, so just a couple of brief comments. Um, with that scaled back version, I really hope we don't take that, that route. And if we do, I noticed that on the bullet it said uh, no sidewalks, no seating, um, no lighting, and that we would be using the Complete Streets grant for this. I'm quite certain that MassDOT would not allow that. So if we were going to take out all of those things, that's essentially eradicating all Complete Streets elements. So I don't think that grant would apply. So we should deduct that if that's the way that we go. But please, don't choose that option. I really don't think we should, for lack of a better word, half-heartedly go at this. This is a big... A big opportunity to change our town. Um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Oh, one, one quick thing. I did hear we have a planner. Um, we don't have a planner on staff, but there is one on contract. I would love to know what she thinks of these. Um, you know, we, we're paying 30 grand, I think, for her salary. I know she's with Woodward and Curran. It would be great to know what that planner thinks of all this. I would love to hear her, her advice. Um, okay. Now I would like to read a brief statement from... Uh, someone I look up to greatly. She's very well respected in the development world, and I am honored to read her remarks. Lisa Albergini, Precinct 6. She couldn't be here tonight. She says, I regret that I cannot be at this important meeting tonight, but appreciate the opportunity to have this read into the record. Winthrop is a wonderful town, but we cannot close our eyes to the fact that we are struggling terribly. We are struggling badly to cover expenses, unable to maintain and improve our streets and infrastructure, watching our CBD further deteriorate, and without the funds or ability to provide many key amenities to our youth and all our residents. We need to pause to get our house in order. We need to ask the hard questions about how we got here and the even more difficult questions about what's needed to turn this situation around. We need thoughtful planning by experienced outside professionals. We need to deal with some residents' concerns over growth and density, which can be addressed through thoughtful development because that is the key to generating revenue. To accomplish this, above all else, we need leadership. And I urge town council to confront all of this head on, to learn what experience is needed to truly address our challenges and to get the help we need to get the answers and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to say that doing this project is um, it's not just about the center, it's about the town as a whole and how we are making or not making smart financial decisions, our schools, our parks, our roads, our public safety, health and services. And, uh, and we, we, uh, we have to fight each other every year to prevent cuts to our schools and teachers. And it happens at the expense of cuts to other parts of the budget like janitors. It's, it's just a fact, and we can't afford to let empty buildings sit there empty and to pay for them to sit there rather than generating revenue and activity that we desperately need. Um, it was an eye-opener to look at the report that the, uh, that the um, I, I just skimmed it, but I could read it a little better, that, that came out of the uh, Winthrop Transportation Advisory Committee, the Livable Streets Alliance. And, um, and I guess that... Winter population's been going down for a while. It just started to rise a little bit. And, um, you know, in, most people don't work in, in Winthrop. Uh, if we had more jobs here, we could keep more money here. So we need, you know, we need infrastructure. We need an awful lot of things. And there has to be money some way. So we, we um, and, and the, the facts say if you had a little bit more um, 
uh, 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 apartments, a lot of times the people aren't aren't even going to be in public school. A lot of times they're they're going to be in um, in in schools out of town and um, in, in the, all these studies and and um, you know you've got to you we have to do something for money and we have to uh, go forward and uh, and not be afraid to do anything in this town because we need the money we need to uh, build up something here and and I think they they didn't answer the question here tonight if we if we spend this twelve million five hundred thousand you said well yes. The taxpayers have to pay something. Well, well, how much does the average taxpayer have to pay? Can they come answer that? Well, you have the accountant's office uh, anonymize that tomorrow and put it on the website and get it out to the people who signed the uh, email list here. Yes. Uh, Steve Hines, Precinct 6. Um, I want to. I just want to go back to the comment when um, I, I work for developers as a career. That's what I do, and I just want to go back to the part about how um, speculators come in and extract profits and then and then leave. Um, the project at 142 Pleasant Street nets the town $116,000 annually um, in tax revenue. Um, there are. 14 of the units are sold now. There's no children that are blocking on down school systems and there's off street parking for all the units. So there, there wasn't, there's not a whole lot of tax burden that that project in particular brings. And I think that that project could be used um, as a model um, for further projects around town. Um, a few weeks ago, um, both um, town manager Delahanty and town council president Vecchia um, had brought up the point that in five years, status quo, no new development, no tax base expansion, um, we're cutting services. We don't have enough money to pay for what we have now. And so when you talk about developers coming in and extracting profits and then leaving, the work that they're doing will be with us forever. Every dollar of tax revenue that's brought in from every new unit of housing that, that, that we can get in here in a responsible way, and I'm all for that, and I haven't seen very many irresponsible plans um, come forward yet, so that's sort of where my baseline is. Um, but every, every dime that they put into it, they extract a very small profit margin. It's very, very tiny, if any of you have ever seen a residential development. It's a razor-thin margin. Um, but those tax revenues will be with us, with each of you, with your kids, um, in this town um, for a very, very, very long time. Um, there are like 400 units at Seal Harbor, and I know that's not like the ideal project, but think about how much tax revenue comes in from that one complex um, alone. Those are expensive units. They're, the assessments are quite high. Um, I think there's one child in all 400 units in that complex today, I think. Um, so talking about schools, because that's really, that's an expensive part of, of how these buildings can increase tax burden. Um, but just really, really think about it. If we want all the things, and I think we've, I've said this at a meeting before about, I know someone brought up Rockport and Salem and all these other waterfront communities. What they have in common is residential density. Their, their, their communities have um, on-staff planners and they have a process um, by, which, by which developers can go through um, to increase residential density. Um, all those communities on the North Shore are building like crazy and we are missing the boat on, uh, we are missing the boat on um, on that. I mean, our time is almost our time is almost past, and, and we've been fighting over this for three years now, and, and still we have nothing done, and we're running out of money, we're running out of time, um, lots and lots of really expensive things going on. I mean, we 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 are, we really don't have have the time to lose here. And I just want to rebut a little bit more on the East Boston and Chelsea being characterless. Those two communities have more character than many, many, many other communities. Um, I envy both of those communities um, in a lot of ways. And I think that we can look at both East Boston and Chelsea and what they're doing. Um, Chelsea, of all places, has made, the it's like the comeback kid. I mean, they have done so much to improve the quality of life in that community. And most of it was funded um, from those greedy developers that are extracting all the profits and then leaving um, their schools and all of that. So just keep that in mind when we're, when we're, we're chasing those people out of town that, that, are, that are actually doing something for us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kathleen Capuccio, not sure the precinct, 49 Waldemar. Um, I think a lot of this conversation is great tonight in the sense of, you know, what our town can do, what we haven't done in comparisons to other communities, and all of that is great. 
but I, I think I'm the first to say his name, and I'll say it tonight. Our former town manager's name is Jim McKenna. I've been at numerous meetings when he was actually here and we weren't paying him to do nothing. And he told us how much money we had. And his CFO told us how much money we had. And they couldn't contribute to Millerfield, even though we had so much money. Now, we might be at a point where you're going to come to us residents sorry for the current council, potentially, and ask us for more money to fund a well-needed project? I can speak for myself, but many others that have done it. I've worked on our last two or three debt exclusions and our last override. I would absolutely work on them again, and I firmly believe in everything we did. There's not a chance I would work on another debt exclusion or override in this community right now with the distrust that I have. The residents of this town have listened, frankly, to someone like me, who's a no one, and to our community leaders, and someone like Jim McKenna, our former town manager, let's call him by his name, who misled this town, whether he was irresponsible or deceptive, I'm not sure. Numerous meetings I can go back to when him and the CFO said how much money we had and how great we were and how wonderful our standing was rating wise. And he has a project that he was in charge of, we pay for him, or paid for him to be the town manager. And it went from X money to this? It's not Stephen Cowell's fault. We were misled, plain and simple. Whether it was intentional or whether it wasn't. The big problem right now is not what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what phase we should do, which way we should go. Most of the citizens have lost trust. That's the biggest problem right now. We've lost trust. It's not the current council's fault or someone's fault. I'm going to put a lot of it on Mr. Jim McKenna who was in charge of doing this. That was his role. Look at the charter. That was his role. I am not going to be on a committee. I know a lot of others that aren't going to be on a committee for another override or another debt exclusion. We've lost trust. So we have to figure out how we need to do what we can do within the money that we have. I know I live at 49 Waldemar. I'm five doors down from what I referred to as the old middle school. I hate looking at that dilapidated building that's been sitting there for I don't know how many years and nothing has happened. Someone has to take responsibility for that. So yes, whether we talk about the options moving forward and all the different things we can do, I'm just saying to those of you in power and in government, know that so much trust has been lost you need to regain it. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. How you doing? Keith Manning, Precinct 3. Um, I just got a couple, a month ago, I was um, lying on my couch eating a ring dink. <laughs> and, I was, and I saw um, the town council talk in the meeting saying exactly what Kathleen was saying. Um, where is McKenna? Where is he? And everybody looked at each other like, what do we do? What's this or that? Is it the town council president that I understood, but I still haven't got an answer on, have you talked to Mr. McKenna? 
okay? Um, there was a couple things like you said on the, your agenda, which I will say about your agenda. Um, I feel he should be here at every single meeting. He's getting paid to be here. He needs to be here. been in the military for 23 years, it is you assist people. He should be here assisting the town council. Okay? Um, the other one, he should be providing continued guidance for the ferry project that he endured. Okay? I just want to know to make sure that you as a council and a council president need to have him here and accountable for this town. And I'm gonna go back to my ring dings later. Thank you. I wanted to speak, but I kind of want to ring ding right now. So, um, I don't know if you can hear. So uh, my name is Bob Carroll, Precinct 6. Uh, I've been volunteering uh, with the planning board for over six years. I've uh, been part of the Citizens Advisory Committee that helped uh, create the master plan. Uh, I've done my best to direct people towards that master plan. It uh, is not perfect, uh, but it starts to create a framework that we can all have a discussion about. This is a very important uh, decision to be made here. Um, and I think there's... Uh, kind of a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, one cost 12 million and one cost three. So let's do three. Um, that is not quite the choice that I think we have. I think, that, as many of you would agree, there are many uh, shades in between of what these choices are. The original project was maybe not poorly managed, but poorly scoped. Uh, it was unrealistic to just do a small portion of just the sewer only, knowing, the, knowing that the water lines were the same vintage or near it, and knowing that uh, we have, you know, no, we're not even talking about climate change, we just, you know, we just have poor drainage. So to, to, to just sort of close your eyes to sort of two thirds of the problem uh, was probably not a good move out of the gate. So that sort of, let's go back to the original scope really isn't, doesn't make much sense. It's not real. It's not enough. We need more. So that, that master plan, um, which, again, available on the website under projects, uh, is, again, not perfect. But it talks about some of these things that have been kind of mentioned about uh, retail leakage. That means everybody's buying stuff on Amazon or going to Revere to buy everything. No one buys anything in town. Hardly anyone works in town anymore unless they're working for themselves. And um, there's just a lot of trends that are working against Winthrop. The master plan tried to identify them and give multiple possibilities on how to move Winthrop forward out of them. I will tell you right now, the first choice wouldn't have been close Hagman Road. That was not a move. You can look at it. It might be mentioned on one page about 200 pages deep in a 250-page document. I don't know why our previous town manager decided to pull that trigger and decided to do it without inviting any of you to the conversation. Uh, it was not through the guidance of the master plan. It's very important for me to try to get the Hagman Road fiasco out from being tied or handcuffed to the master plan. I don't want the baby thrown out with the bathwater. I would ask you all to just take a look at it. It talks about a lot of things. The next topic, if we can stand it, the middle school site can help solve this problem that we have in front of us. Does it have to be 12 and a half? No, but it ain't gonna be three, so how do we bridge that gap? We've had some good luck getting mass development grants and mass works grants. You have talented people, one was uh, up on stage a second ago. Uh, there's others in, in your community that have development experience, grant writing experience, and once we have a vision, it's really much easier to write to the state about what you want because you know where you're going, and the state knows where you're going, and they want to support you. If you don't know where you're going, it's hard to write those grants, and the state gives you about 10 cents on the dollar just to keep you quiet. 
So we need this vision. We do need it soon. We need to come together. Um, and, uh, you know, last thing I'll talk about is the, uh, the landscape architect, which I feel personally responsible for. I advocated very strongly for a landscape architect. They, uh, the town, whoever was running that project, was doing it with a civil engineer only. It's the equivalent of using a podiatrist for you know, brain surgery. It's not a good idea. So they're very good at what they're doing, but they need to stay under the surface and talk about pipes. Um, there's a whole aesthetic piece. We're ripping apart an enormous amount, even on the small, if you just do the green, not the blue, right in the center of our town. The idea that that was just going to be put back with just asphalt was a huge misunderstanding of what the scope of this project needed to be. So anyway, I just, in closing, I just urge you to just take a look at the master plan. I'm not saying it's perfect, but there's a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that are floating around, and I've had the benefit of sort of having a front row seat for maybe five or six years now. Uh, where I know you all haven't, uh, and so that, that should get out there and uh, hopefully you have a chance to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter? Good evening. Peter Gill, Precinct 5. First of all, I want to thank the council for, for having this forum tonight. I think it's great. And I only wish that so many of these people that are here tonight had been here for, for some of the earlier meetings that, that took place. Um, I want to thank Steve Keller for that great presentation tonight. And I want to thank Bob uh, Carroll. Bob Carroll has been a, a leader in this community. It's been my pleasure to watch him through this whole process, as difficult as, as it has been. Um, and, and Frank Costantino has been involved for years. Um, and I want to uh, borrow some of Frank's comments. I want to borrow some of Bob's comments. And I particularly like Steve's comment about uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, Steve has been responsible for some significant, aesthetically pleasing um, things that have happened in our community. The, the different com what I'd like to do tonight is not go back and say what went wrong over the last two years. I'd like to say let's start here and move forward. Um, and it doesn't matter what happened before. Let's start in a new place. We've had some tremendous improvements in this community over, over, the year, over the years. I hear from people who used to live here who have come back to visit, and they say, Winthrop is a different place. You drive over that bridge, brand new. You drive by the new high school. You drive by the boarded up Dalrymple School. You drive by the abandoned hospital. You drive by the parks. All of these things have, have contributed to our community. And guess what? People are moving here, people who have never been here before, and saying, where was this hidden jewel? Why didn't we know about it? I don't believe any money we spend tonight is a cost. I think the money that we spent on the new high school, on Miller Field, on the parks, I don't call that cost. I call it investment. Let's look at the values of the properties in this community. What have they done? They haven't gone down. They've gone up. We have a decision tonight, not tonight, over the next several months to let our council know what we want to do. Do we want to do nothing? And it costs nothing. Do we want to do a lot that costs a lot? And where does the money come from? We don't want any development. We don't want any overrides. We don't want any debt exclusions. But we want a beautiful community. As Frank said, we need to figure out what we want. We want to be, be a nice, small hometown with all tiny houses, and we don't pay any real estate taxes, and we watch the center continue to go down the tubes. While we have taken all of these other pieces of, of this community and made them better, I think that you and I, whether we're 20 years old or 80 years old, we need to realize the jewel that we're sitting on and not let that jewel go to hell. We need to preserve it. We need to invest in it. And I, I believe in this community. I am a senior citizen. I am on a fixed income. I am retired. But I want to invest in my community because I love this community. And I believe that if we let it go, it's going to go. We can go one way or the other. We're here right now. We can do this, or we can do that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mark Abishan, I'm uh, Precinct 1. Steve, if I can just get your attention for a second. Can we get back to the slide that was showing the different colors? Do you have the ability to do that? Mark, you can pull that mic out if you want. It's more comfortable. Okay. So the original was the green. The yellow got added, and then the blue got thrown in. Um, I took the time to actually watch your uh, YouTube meeting with uh, Steve and Terry. And uh, I found it extraordinarily informative. And I thank you guys for doing that. In particular, um, Steve, you were talking about the size of the pipe. And we talked about this at the dog uh, at the end, where the pipe size for, I believe, the drainage got increased. And you were talking about how that added significantly to the cost because of the need for the, the, the run uh, to allow for the drainage to work, essentially. Um, and I wanted, you, did, you didn't mention it here, but you did talk about it then. Terry, you mentioned um, about the flooding in particular and how the inlets to the drain. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to screw this up. So there is sewage. I want to be really clear. There's sewage. That's the stuff that's going down your drain into Deer Island. There's drainage. That's the stuff, the storm runoff that's going out towards the beach. And then there's the water. So I just want to clarify that. Some, there was somebody made a comment about that. They are separated. Um, the flooding, you said in particular, if there was more access to the drainage, that that might help to mitigate that. Is that correct? One specific area of the scent that that is correct. Okay. So, because that's one of the things that I think Mr. Lucero made the point of is like everybody had water, you know, two feet of water in the entire area. Um, Again, the size of the pipes. Is this drainage that we're talking about? Or is this sewerage, Steve? Drainage. Drainage, okay. Sewer will also be large. All right. The scope of this, I'm going to just say it. I mean, uh, I think it's grand that the people that live there that have this, but this was supposed to be a, you know, business district project, and it's business district, and a whole lot of residential got sort of added to it. I'm not saying you guys aren't deserving. I'm just saying, look, let's cut to the chase of the cost unless, you know, you're going to be telling us that, well, this place has to be tied in because all of this is bad. And let's face it, there's age of infrastructure and everything else. But reality is there's critical need, there's need, there's want. Um, I do agree that there's a need for an aesthetic overlay when it's all done to make it, you know, it's a, it's a finish. But, you know, from a critical need standpoint to a need standpoint to a want standpoint, I think this can be scaled back to accommodate the scale of economy, for lack of a better way to say it, to make it work. Um, you know, and I think the focus should be, for right now, the center. Um, this isn't showing the topography and that all these streets tend to flow down into the center. I mean, it's a bowl and it, you know, this is what happens. But I mean, I, if you could speak to that a little bit, uh, because it was, I found that to be an informative and enlightening point that you made, uh, to be fair. Uh, that. The size of what was being utilized greatly impacted the costs. And, you know, aside from the fact that other things weren't taken into account, like the police details and everything else, that was sort of like a hidden thing that was a surprise for later. I agree with you. It should have been added and should have been disclosed, which I think speaks to the trust that uh, was mentioned earlier. But can you speak up for that real quick? I'm not quite sure what, you, what your question is. Uh, the, the drainage is a major component to the project. Uh, to speak to the, to, uh, the former gentleman's uh, uh, remarks about, you know, uh, the first initial proposal being solely a, a sewer project uh, was a poor decision. It, it, it did, doesn't mean that we didn't know the other utilities need to be done, but here we are talking about phased construction. And that was the first phase of, of a construction project that turned into a mega project. So it, it wasn't our intention never to address the drainage or the, or the, or the water. Um, the sewer at the time and now in the present, uh, we, have, we have many parts of that, pro, uh, that, that system that are failing. Collapsed mains, we had a, a, a full collapse of a main on, on Woodside Avenue back in 2007 in front of uh, Letary's uh, uh, 
store. Um, failed, uh, saw a manhole and, and a collapse of the main. So that was, that got to the video in and inspecting the entire area. And, and that first project that was being put together or proposed that was added to the, to the, to the capital improvement plan was a, a sewer uh, restoration project in and around the French Square area. Um, so I, I know I didn't fully address your, I'm not really sure where you're going with, with, the, with the drainage question. It is a major, it's a major uh, financial component of the project, uh, especially uh, you know, after the, the historic rainfall that occurred in September 2017. It brought to light that the water couldn't be moved from the street into the system quick enough. Uh, there wasn't enough structures, as, as uh, Terry uh, just uh, spoke to. Um, there's no capacity in the storm drain system. Uh, it's, it's totally uh, reliant on the tide. If the tide's up, that water has nowhere to go. So enlarging those pipes creates capacity. And obviously, the increased capacity, you still got to get the water from the surface into that, into that system, which is the need for the, the, the more... Uh, the more structures, the more catch basins. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but it is a major component of the project. All right, Eric, I'm sorry I can't quote it. it. It was something that you had mentioned that just had caught my attention. Um, I mean, it was, the, the, it was around the same time when Terry was talking about the, the inlets, but that's all right. Um, I, all I'm going to say about this is if you ever talk to a mechanic when something's happening in the inside of your engine, they'll tell you this is the time to do other things. Um, it costs a lot just to open it up. If all this stuff is that old, it should all be done at once. One time, be done. It's cost effective in the long run. Um, I just don't know if it should be including a lot of the blue in addition to, and how much taking that off of scale is gonna affect the overall cost. Um, it seems like, you know, trust, money, these are all the factors that everybody's here for. Um, that, Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jean Coughlin from Precinct 5. Um, I know many of you from going to meetings for probably six months now or so. Um, anyway, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the Center Business District, the infrastructure. Um, project and the impact it's going to have. So everyone in town is going to be impacted by it. We all know that. Residents, business owners, everybody in this town. Um, I am going to butter to one of the buildings that is proposed, I guess, to, to um, be developed. Okay, And that's been kind of what my mission's been for probably the last seven or eight months. Um, I live on the bottom of the Cottage Park Road. Um, next to the building that actually sits on my property line. Nobody's going to be more impacted than my husband and myself living in that house if they're going to do a building that sits on my line. Um, so after six months of waiting for an answer, and I was helped along um, by Terry, who worked hard to get me an answer that answered the zoning changes that were done without notice to me, um, and many people in 2014, ordinance changes, um, no notice to abutters, said I missed it in a paper, okay. Um, but no other means of communication. Um, so I did receive an answer that they can't go more than two and a half stories next to a resident or 35 feet. So I'm grateful for that. And thank you to Terry Delahanty for coming up with the lawyer's um, answer. Um, the master plan, I still have one little request. I've looked it over. Um, it shows my house and 11 other residences in the center business district. There were lines drawn behind our house uh, to include us, um, I think, in scenario to go four stories high or more if we weren't a residence and we were included in the district. But therefore, they did come up with the answer. But I would feel more comfortable if those lines were gone, that they don't still show on the master plan. It makes me nervous. I don't sleep at night thinking, why are they still there? And it's up on a website, and everybody can see it. Um, 
So I would like to have them removed. Um, I'm just going to ask, you know, politely for that. Um, the future development of Winthrop Center, I think that the zoning should go back to what it is. I think it's going to look crazy with these big, huge buildings down there. I know we need development. I absolutely know it. I've been living and looking at abandoned buildings for, well, I'm in my house thir over 30 years, so I can tell you right now, the eyesore that we look at, the rodents, the boarded up, like glasses blown out. It, come down and look. I mean, you've all seen it. It's pretty atrocious um, in this pretty little town that we have. Um, so for months I've been coming to meetings and I speak and everybody's been so good to listen. But we've had so many educated, talented, and so many smart residents that have spoken at these meetings. Um, they have appeared at most of the probably the last six months of town council meetings, um, giving really positive input. Asking the town council to, quote, take a step back, um, have a vision, have a moratorium on this. Um, figure out what you are going to use these buildings for and then zone appropriately. We need to take one step at a time. So constantly adding projects, you know, has driven up the cost. It didn't begin that way, but more and more things keep happening, which adds to it and adds to the cost. It's, it's not anybody here tonight's fault, but it is previous people's fault for not communicating with us and letting us know about the cost and the loans and things like that. So nobody can still, um, I know we can't endure, you know, going up more and more on our taxes. Yeah, we want it to some extent. I want to see things happen. Infrastructure definitely needs to be done, okay, before anything else can be done. Um, my neighbor Donna Riley um, put, and I'll quote her one night, um, said at one of the meetings, we're not obstructionists. I'm not opposed to building. I'm not scared of the building um, of development around here. Um, I would love to see these abandoned properties. I'd like something nice next to my house. Love it. Um, but, you know, nothing, nothing happens. We do just keep talking about it. Um, I want to be involved in part of the process, and everybody's known that all along. And they've included me and listened to me. I do thank everybody for that, because the previous council didn't listen to me, didn't inform me, knew me, said hello to me, but never approached me on things that they had done without my knowledge. Okay, so that I do reprimand them for. Um, I do think that we need to look out for the residents, not the developers, that will reap all the profits and the benefits for selling condos and, you know, um, tie into our infrastructure. And then they're going to sell everything and move away and not look back. They're not going to live here. They're just going to do what they have to do, make some money and move on. We're all going to be here with, with living with what they develop. Um, so I want to thank everybody uh, tonight for allowing me to be heard tonight. I do thank the new council. Peter's my councilman, and he's done a terrific job. Mike Lacerdo, everybody. I mean, you guys have been really a, a breath of fresh air, I do believe. Um, Ron, just all the new members, everybody listens, OK? And I thank them for their availability to listen to me in um, many others, meeting after meeting. My last, uh, I will sum it up here, is good communication is the key to the success of the future and the vision for Winthrop on all the projects. Um, I think one thing I can say, and I'm grateful for, is that I do thank the new town manager, um, Terry, to keep that newsletter coming out. Carla Vitale puts it on. Denise Quist posts everything. The calendar goes up. Uh, Ron Vecchi is doing a, a town manager show. It informs people. Not everybody can get to the meetings. Not everybody's aware. But there is more. It's not just in the transcript anymore. Not everybody reads the transcript. Okay, so I do applaud you all for, for doing what you do and posting the meetings, delivering it, sending out emails, and, um, you know, Peter having meetings. Um, Mike will be available to talk to me at any time for concerns and want to hear them. Okay? So thank you for tonight for the, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Donna? Um, yeah, 
Yes, Donna Segretti Riley, Precinct 5, uh, 30 Cottage Park Road. I live across the street from Jean. Uh, first of all, and I know I may be repetitive, thank you so much, Mr. Vecchia, uh, the town council, and um, town manager Delahanty for affording us this opportunity to even have this public forum. This is uh, very, very refreshing. Um, first of all, I, I was quoted as saying, uh, I'm not an obstructionist. I would like to see some positive development. Uh, I look at the same two buildings at, on, on Somerset Ave at the corner of the end of my street at Cottage Park Road and Somerset Ave. It would be nice to see something new and um, positive there uh, that could, with revenues developed, um, contribute to the overall services of our town. Um, I did want to say, and I think that we're, we're working on that and we've seen much improvement in my second point of uh, the development should should include input from neighbors, abutters, and existing small businesses. In well, since October, when I went to one of the first meetings, um, I've seen that greatly improve. And uh, as Jean said, not everybody reads the transcript, but Town Manager Del Hanty, if you go to uh, the uh, the blog of the Town Manager, and if you don't get it give the town manager's office a call and they'll put your email on that and every Thursday you'll get to know what's going on in this town. One thing he did add in particular was the website for the town and said, you know, if you want to know what meetings are happening, you click on, you know, the calendar and then click again and you get the agenda to the calendar. But he even goes one step further and he lists the important town meetings that are public and happening. This was not the case you know, just six months ago. Uh, and I commend you for that, uh, Town Manager Delahanty. Because um, as Jean said, with communication, I think we can uh, work positively and together on something uh, creative and, and essential for the growth, uh, the positive, reasonable growth of our town. Uh, just two issues on, on this the CBD are the one of height of buildings, uh, the heights of the buildings, and um, parking, which uh, many of us have talked about before. But I think as uh, Senator Boncori alluded to, this was 30 years ago. People were still talking about the parking. But these are, these are two elements that really have to be looked at, the, uh, the height of the building. Uh, they, they, you, know, you just have to so have something that's reasonable and fits in with with uh, the residents to have something super big overlooking the yards of the abutters is intrusive at best um, my final my final uh, point though however is and I know <clears throat> I know that um, the previous speaker uh, mentioned this about the town planner and and I I would like a specific answer if anybody has anything to offer um, as far as the town planner and, and what she sees at this point, at this juncture, uh, for further development in a relatively dense community, um, which I understand we're not second. Uh, Councilor Cerno indicated we were 15. <laughs> so I, I got that. But, what, you know, where are we with the town planner? And is there any vision uh, or concrete recommendations that that she has been able to offer at this point. Thank you, Donna Rod. The town planner is a contract employee, a contract, uh, independent contractor that works with the planning, the, uh, the planning board. Um, this project, I don't believe, has been run by her um, to date. Um, she basically spends most of her time with the planning board and um, the projects that are going before the planning board. Uh, the $30,000 was under the planning board's uh, budget uh, for this year. So we can certainly send it, but it eats away at the $30,000 that was allocated to give the guidance and give the um, expertise to the planning board. But, 
you know, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe I'm alone in this, but that's not what I saw her role to be. Um, it was, you know, what to do with, the, what, what do we do? You know, give us some direction about the business district in the center. And that, in fact, is not the case. I mean, what would we need to do? Who would we need to hire to get that kind of direction, Terry? We can get that kind of direction. What I'm saying at $30,000, um, we certainly might not be able to get that direction without another transfer into that line item. Um, I, I Personally, I have no stake in this game. I took this project on uh, nine months ago, and um, I, I don't keep who, who reviews it and who gives an opinion on it. It's something that the council wants me to do. I'll, they can direct me to do that. Do you, Mr. Becky, have any any response to you know a real? If it's money, then there'll be a discussion with the council to see if we want to make a, a, a transfer, increase that line item, and, and uh, have a review of this project. If that's the wishes of the council. I mean, that's what I thought the intent was uh, for the town planner in the beginning. I felt a real sense of relief, like, oh, now we have a town planner. They're going to give us an overview or some idea of, yeah. of what as, is feasible. As Terry have. suggested, she reviews any project that's going to be in the town, but she hasn't actually reviewed this project. She, but the development projects, right? I want to be pretty sure what we said at the council, the development projects that go before the planning board to make sure they're consistent with the master plan and consistent with the development that was on the books. That's what she was hired. This is an infrastructure project um, that was already well on the way before the planner even came on. The planner didn't even come on until, I believe, January um, of this year. So certainly those developments that are happening in the center, she does review. Or has been proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Mr. Ciotis. My name is Nick Ciotis, Precinct 5. Mr. Vecchia, I'd like to thank you so much for reaching out to this community tonight. It wasn't this tremendous? This is democracy at its finest. i also like to thank Peter Christopher, who initiated Precinct meetings. and all the counselors that are up there. I want to thank everybody up there. We have such great leadership in these four people right up here, in Terry, Steve, Joe, everybody. Steve Cal has done an incredible job. Terry Delahanty has opened up lines of communication. Things are finally transparent here. I am so excited about what's going on with this council because I think this council will do the right thing. I have a deep respect for past presidents of the council that are here tonight, Peter Gill, Tom Riley, so many more. Bob Driscoll, my next door neighbor, and a very honorable man. However, I must speak the truth. And Mrs. Rowe, my high school teacher, told me a long time ago, the toughest thing to do, Mr. Ciotis, is to speak in public. Things were not as kosher as they seem. In 2014, when the vote was taken for the ordinances, and I mean a serious vote. There were no abutters, no residents, and no neighbors at that meeting. This was a very impactful vote, not just for the center district, but for the whole town. When they changed the ordinances, they changed the law. This is law right now, every single ordinance. Now, would the residents have agreed with them? probably most of them, we're not obstructionists. We know we need development, but we want responsible development. Responsible development that is not going to change the character and the jewel that Winthrop is. We all felt invisible. You know how important everybody in this room is? We just had an election. It was 11 votes. It was 11 votes that Ron Vecchia beat a formidable candidate in Mr. Turkle. When we were coming to the other meetings, we felt like we weren't even heard. Nobody heard us. We're right in the impact zone. Somerset Ave, Cottage Park Road, Bartlett Road, Woodside Avenue. There's no parking anywhere. 
Go down Bellevue Avenue sometime. You won't find parking. Cottage Park Road, you can only park on one side of it, the right-hand side, because Mr. Vanderlinde's house had a fire years ago, and they couldn't get the fire truck down. Okay, that center area, I've, I've lived there my whole life, is the lowest point. It's very narrow. A Pepsi truck could take up the whole right-hand side. Okay? When two cars are parked in inclement weather on either side, it's very hard for an SUV to get by, never mind a fire truck. All of these things are crucial factors. In addition to that are the people, the residents. We matter. Somebody once told me, oh, you'll have a little pain a few years. Really? I'm going to be in pain a few years? I'm sorry. I don't pay my taxes to be in pain. I have a lovely neighborhood where we've been not just neighbors but family. People matter. Residents matter. And it's so important that whatever is done down the center, be it the least amount of money or the most amount of money, they have to take the people into consideration because there's going to be dust, there's going to be toxins flying in the air, there's going to be infrastructure work, there's going to be construction work, demolition work, trucks. We had a hard three months this summer. And all over town, it's very, very difficult. I cannot believe the job that Steve Callow does. It, it's amazing. It really is. My concern also is the way the process went. In 2014, all the ordinances are changed. In 2016, the master plan is implemented. I'm going to meetings at the, at the uh, Robert DeLeo Center, and I'm at these meetings with my neighbors, and we're sitting in those meetings, and we have no idea that every single ordinance has been changed. And we keep going to the meetings and going to the meetings. And suddenly one day, one of our neighbors walks down the street and sees a big sign, 20 plus units, 20 plus units on a building. Did anybody contact anybody in the neighborhood? No. So what did we do? The entire neighborhood did what our counselor was supposed to do because our counselor at the time was supposed to knock on our door. Knock on our door just like he did when they wanted our boat and said, listen, we want to do some construction, we want to do some development down the center, and we need everybody to come. None of that happened. It was silence. It wasn't right. So what we did is we went to action and we interviewed about 100 people. We had some very bright people write a resident proposal about quality of life. And thank you to town officials like Mr. Delahanty and Mr. Vecchia. It is now on the town website. That should not have been done by the residents. There should have been outreach. It, people should have come into the neighborhood, ask, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? We're not obstructionists. There's a developer right now that has on-site parking, and we're in favor of him developing. However, when there's no communication and people don't feel like they're valued, like they're invisible, it's not good for a community. This is the finest community in the whole North Shore. And we want to keep it this way because this community is about families. It's about the whole town waiting for an Olympian at the bridge after winning the Olympics. It's about Mark Wallers raising $11,000 for the Cohen family. It's about the people on Thornton Park Road taking care of a 100-year-old school teacher. It's about us making sure that we do not drive out our senior citizens. It's about waiting three hours at Kirby Funeral Home for the passing of a school principal. This is what our community is about. We want to make sure that we keep this warmth. And we better make sure that we show a deep respect for our seniors and we don't drive them out of this community. Everybody wants the best. But like Mr. Murray said, we have to do what we can afford. So I hope that this council really understands their constituents because we're backing you, but you have to back us. And we have to do what's best for this community. And if there has to be some adjustments to the ordinances and that'll make things go much better with developers, then it has to happen like Mrs. Riley said. So I hope everybody keeps coming to these meetings. 
Mr. Vecchia did a fantastic job bringing the community together tonight. This has not happened in years. This is not five or six people making a decision. This is a town decision. And let me tell you something. If the town decided to vote for the entire $12 million, I would be on board because that's democracy. And if the town decides to do what's affordable, and I'm on board with that. But please, every official in this town has to understand that every single Winthrop bite matters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Folks, uh, I just need a little guidance. We have two other items to discuss in your quarter to nine. Huh? You, you're fine? Go ahead, my friend. You're up. My name is, oh, thank you. My name is Mark Wallace, Precinct 2, also um, owner of the Winthrop Marketplace. Um, I want to come from a different point of view, from a retailer's point of view and a business. Something has to get done by, uh, down the center. The marketplace originally was going to go where the family dollar store was. We looked at that over, I would say, 22 years. But when I looked at it, the basement was flooded. You couldn't come down there. Would we have added growth down the center? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but something has to get done down the center. Whether we go, as Nick just said, 12 million, 2 million, 3 million, it doesn't matter. We have to do something down there. But I also want to say what a community we live in. Um, we just raised some money for a poor little boy, but it would have never been done without the community we live in and the people we have here. We have a very good council led by a very good council, President Ron. And Ron, thank you. Thank the council. Thank Terry, Steve, Joe, and Denise. You guys are doing a great job. We have to look at this community. Where do we want to go? From, a, from business, you're not going to attract businesses unless we do something, unless we work together. We have to look at that. I look at it as a business, but I also look at the community. My son now is in the business, which I'm very thankful. My daughter-in-law, I love very much, and she is, keeps me on tune, and also my little granddaughter. But we have a community. Which way are we going to go? We have to make a decision real, real soon. We don't want to lose this money, but we got to look at it as a community. Ron and your fellow counselors, you came into a tough, tough thing. And I applaud you for what you're doing. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you guys also for the hard work you do. Very, very appreciative. But please, let's make a decision. We can go over this. We can have all the meetings. But we got to make a decision soon. We want businesses to come into town. We want to thrive. And there's no better place to thrive than Winthrop. We have the best community here. As Paul Lacerdo said, you're not going to have businesses down here. The, bus the center will be closed if we don't do something down there. The businesses will be flooded. Let's work together and get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hi, my name is Phyllis, and I'm in Precinct 5. And I just have a quick, really quick, less than three-minute question. It's about the new zoning allowances. Are those public information? Can I get them on the website? Because the zoning changes in 2014 that a lot of us weren't aware of, I think at one of these meetings, no, I know at one of these meetings, they were going to be revisited, those zoning changes. And I don't know if they have been or if they're still going to be. Thank you. They have, they have not been uh, revisited. Um, there is a zoning uh, study that we, we did do um, that Jean referred to earlier um, that laid out the zoning in, in the Center Business District um, pretty accurately that's on the website. 
Um, so I have also asked the building commissioner to do a um, commissioner's bulletin to uh, reconfirm the study if he believes in that study. Um, that's the building inspectors and building commissioner's responsibility is to make sure those lines are drawn uh, correctly. Uh, so I've asked him to review that packet. It's a pretty extensive packet and uh, he's doing that but also um, you know the council um, will discuss it at the next council meeting as well uh, if we want to revisit those zonings oh, I lied. would it be fair to say that there's a deadline date for that to change zoning well just to make it public to, to let us know what the hell they are so they're public example, they are public they are public now they're on the uh, website under the ordinances. Um, they are public. Okay. So hypothetically, if I bought the old CVS building yep. and I was the developer and I was told previously that I could build four stories up, does that still stand? Their development hasn't been approved. It won't stand. They haven't submitted any plans. The zoning allows it. Right currently? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we need to revisit that, right? Right? I think we're here to take your we're here to take your information. That's what we're here for. That's what this evening's for. Get your input. Okay. Okay. So I can expect something someday soon, maybe. <laughs> maybe. What do you maybe. think, Council? Members? Yeah. Yes. Soon? Yes. No? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Judy Teixeira, um, Precinct 2, and it's not easy for me standing here. If it wasn't for Nick Ciotis, I wouldn't be here. Um, see, you can't hear. Okay. Um, I am in the bullseye of uh, the middle school. I am right there, my house. Uh, we've lived there for 20 years. My husband and I, um, born and raised here, my grandparents, my parents, uh, and we want to stay here. Um, I'm raising my kids here. Um, and the biggest problem we have is nobody tells us a thing. This meeting is great. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Terry and uh, Mr. Vecchia. But in the future, it, this has to, the abutters have to be notified. Um, I don't want to come home from work one night and have a bulldozer in my driveway putting up a skyscraper. Um, so the big thing with me is you know, to please notify us, keep us informed, and remember that it is a neighborhood. It's a good neighborhood. It's a great town, and let's keep it that way. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, uh, fellow counselors, would you, anyone like to make a comment? You want to go straight to the next one? Here we go. Middle school, Joe Domilovitz. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but I want to make sure everybody understands that this is just a kind of going over what the master plan had considered and that uh, no decisions have been made on the middle school reuse or, or the site or the buildings or anything at this point. The council wants to get your input and hear what the town wants to hear or hear, hear what the town wants to see down on that site. And so these are discussion points. These are places to jump off and discuss. So, um, The master plan process took place in 2016 and 17, and it began in late 2013, uh, 2015. Um, the, the purpose of the master plan process was to try to find a way to reuse the middle school site uh, in a way that integrated it with the surrounding area, in particular the center business district. The, uh, the goal was to try to uh, find an economic development strategy for that site that would benefit the, the community as a whole and get public input, excuse me, get public input uh, into that process. Uh, the initial proposal that got us the grant funding did not include the rink in its scope of work because it, the rink is financially solvent and was well supported among folks in the community. So the decision was made uh, by the town at the time that they applied for the grant. We applied for the grant not to include the rank, but to include the three buildings that were associated with the old middle school. 
prior to applying for the grant funds, the town did undertake um, to bring in representatives from the state, developers, people in the business community to try to gauge and generate interest in redevelopment of the site. We had over 20 visits in an 18 month period with different people trying to get their interest and get them to offer us ideas. It was, it was a tough slog. Everybody wanted to know what the town wanted first. Thus the master plan process. Out of the master planning process came four options as, and a fifth, the four options developed by the consultants and a fifth that was developed by the Economic Development Citizens Advisory Committee. They, uh, they helped frame the master plan and they were um, great advocates for considering a fifth option that would include the rink. The first option for the middle school reuse is shown up here. It's uh, simply a redevelopment of the existing buildings as they are. Um, both the master plan consultants and the citizens advisory committee were opposed to this option as it provides the least economic development incentive and future tax revenue for the community and would be the most likely to add cost to the town in the short term. Option two was to sell the middle school building itself to be redeveloped or reused as is as a mixed use building with residential and commercial uses with the existing auditorium and gymnasium remaining for community uses in a kind of a community node with the rink. Uh, one of the goals of this would be to use the proceeds from the sale of the middle school building to make any improvements to the community node of buildings, including potentially building out, building out the gymnasium for a more complete community center. Option three, oh, sorry, that's another view of option two. Option three is uh, to demolish and sell the school building and the auditorium to be re redeveloped as a new, larger, mixed-use residential commercial building with a more expansive plaza connecting Ingleside Park to the Center Business District and to maintain, the de de maintain and develop the gymnasium space as a new community center with the rink. The new plaza could be designed to serve as a connector to and a meeting space as well as an outdoor performance center. Again, as with option two, the improvements would be paid, the improvements to the public side would have been paid for out of the proceeds of the sale of the public building. That's another view, uh, an artist's rendering of what it might look like. Again, not a plan, just an idea. Option four was to sell the entire site except for the rink to a developer that would develop multi-family housing across the site inclusive of potentially smaller townhomes closer to Waldemar Avenue and a larger mixed-use multifamily development building that would front on Pauline Street. That could potentially look something like this. Again, the rink was left out of this because that was what the original scope of work was. At the uh, urging of the Economic Development Citizens Advisory Committee, the master plan did contemplate very briefly an option five, which I is was worth contemplating and probably should have been included from the outset and we can ask Mr. Aiello I know he has one uh, one proposal for how to use option five and I'd let him to speak to that but essentially the basics of option five are that you would sell the entire three acres to a developer who would relocate a new rink elsewhere under the property and develop housing around the rink and community center again the rank community center, I think, might be. Well, I, we'll let Mr. Allo address that. <laughs> Put the slide up. You want to go back? No, to slide five. No, Joe's slide. Oh, oh just to Joe's slide. Okay, Eight. that's it. Yep. So I'm Joe Allo, precinct five, and um, I'll proudly say that I'm neither an architect nor a planner, just a kibitza. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's my skill set, right? So I, I went to as many of the master plan uh, meetings as I could possibly attend, and it struck me that the members of the Center uh, Advisory Committee uh, had it right from the very beginning, which was that uh, it was somewhat illogical that we were not considering the hockey rink um, as part of the, the, the complete reuse. And my thought process uh, was reinforced by the fact that a number of speakers 
Uh, during that community process, who were around when the original rink was built, I was living in East Boston at the time, um, mentioned the fact that that rink is really a temporary structure uh, with about a 25-year useful life and had built in about 1975. So even I, who am not that good at math, could figure out things are happening. And then I talked to a num number of members of the skating community who described that there really are some structural problems and other kind of problems inherent in the rink. I then went over and talked with Michael Ruzioni um, because his name is part of the, uh, the naming of that area and asked him uh, whether or not um, he had ever thought about having a replacement rink. And you should talk to Mike Ruzioni directly without taking my word for it, but his reaction was, gee, we need a rink that rink does struggle, it has certain limitations, but the most important thing, it's, a, it's the Lassen family rink. Let me talk to the Lassen family. And it really says the Michael Ruzioni Community Center, and when they renamed it after the 1980 a gold medal Olympic team celebrations, um, the, the community had represented that there would really be a community center there for the youth and all ages of the community in addition to the rink. So uh, Mike talked to the Lassen family. They said, gee, they'd be open to a replacement rink. And that got sort of just my pea brain started and a little bit of figuring, fooling around with forms on the site, having listened to neighbors, concerns, etc. There are a couple of things to remember about the site. One is that as you go down towards the CVS end of the site, so the right-hand side of the site, you're really going downhill. And you are getting farther and farther away from any residential buildings. So if you wanted to introduce any height in and near the center area, that's probably not a bad place to do it. Um, and the thought was, well, what if we uh, finished off the site first of all, and they had some good ideas that came from the master plan site that said, let's build a set of uh, single family homes or two family homes right across the street from the existing two family homes. I think there was one resident who said, they were worried about there was going to be an office tower next door or someday there was going to be demolition. Maybe we just restore and finish off the residential character of the neighborhood up at this end. Then we could knock down, by, in order to do that, you'd have to begin to knock down the school. Behind the school, you could build a replacement skating rink. That replacement skating rink is the next structure here. It's about 25% bigger than the current structure. I just made that up. I am not a rink specialist, but I heard it's very difficult because of the limited number of, of um, locker rooms to be able to flip between two games, one after each other, and especially when you're going from uh, boys' games to girls' games. So I made it about 20% bigger. We figured out how to put some more locker rooms in there and set it in. The building to the right of that, with the little glass uh, roof on it, is a representation of a typical community center that you see in a lot of places. This is a place where t you could have elderly programs during the day, you could have after school programs and evening programs for the kids, you could have young adult programs, you have climbing walls, basketball gyms, potentially an indoor pool, really up to the community to think about the kind of program that's there. But one the thing that we heard over and over again during the community process is that people were looking for an, a public amenity that really helps strengthen the character of the town and help bring people together. So certainly a new skating rink with all of the features of a skating rink as well as a community center seemed like it was a repeated request by a number of people. And then down at the back end was some housing. And this is housing where perhaps you get to the 45 foot height uh, four stories of buildings that people were talking about. Um, I'm only presenting this to say it's an idea. One key point is that whatever we do on the site, it needs to be tested by professionals. We need to make sure we understand whether or not you can find adequate parking there. We need to understand how different uses might relate to the center so people who are either living or visiting those sites, might come in and shop or dine in Winthrop Center, therefore helping the, the business district. 
we have to go back to the water and sewer and drainage program, which was the first item in the agenda tonight, and make sure that whatever site, whatever we're going to be doing on that site is, is contemplated by that water and sewer program and all the utility programs. So there needs to be an integration um, of this site with whatever is going to be happening with the infrastructure. So what we're hoping, I think, with the council is to help get the community to revisit different ideas on the site and to come to a consensus on it. It's very clear that one cannot begin to build on this site until we have a clear commitment that we have the infrastructure that can support this amount of activity. So item one on the agenda was the right thing to worry about first. But since this is such a complicated site to, to think about, and since there are so many options that have been contemplated, it's worth getting in that process now so that once the utility work is confirmed and committed, then the town can think about developing a financial plan and think about the feasibility and what option it wants to proceed with. So thank you for the couple of minutes and I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, Joe. Just a couple of questions, Joe. <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the development, on the housing, how many, how many units you, you, potentially you're talking on the site? Would you think? On the, on the left, on the left side in green. Yep. I, we just sort of formed up a blocky thing that could be individual single townhouses, family house, houses, or it could be townhouses. Okay. I think that's really a function of a discussion there. Yep. If you took what we outlined there and you made that uh, four stories high and you assumed that the first floor was largely retail and perhaps like a gym associated with the with the, with the units. I think that came up to be about 50 units total. Okay. Uh, but again, that was assuming number of units because we're assuming it was one, one bedroom or two bedroom units because we had heard the concern about impact on schools. Right. And so when you have predominantly one and two bedroom units, you have fewer children, you don't have quite the impact on the schools. And similar to what Stephen talked about for the development uh, for the old, from the old nursing home, it could be a positive cash flow to help support some of the construction and operations of the public amenities on the site. Okay, thank you. Can we go back to one of the slides that has the, the original footprint? It's probably right at the beginning. It's not, it's not changing places. Right there. So this is the this is the configuration right now, and I have heard over the last several years, I guess initially when this whole project went online or this whole concept of what we were going to do on this site, that this this building was written off, that it couldn't be rehabbed, and it was all about development. That's what I heard. But recently, I took a developer that did some beautiful work in Winthrop that people are talking about through here. Terry and I went through and he took a look at this building and even the auditorium. And basically that gentleman said that he could put about 60 units in there just the way it's constructed right now. Uh, he talked about amenities like opening it up. Uh, this could be one residential area here between these two about 60 units. Parking off site this could be parking and also above it condos. This could be condos as well. Um, the gentleman and his partner were the type of people that are very sensitive to neighborhoods and sensitive to design to make sure that it works in with the, with the uh, residents. And that really took me, just, just listening to what he had to say. He, the individual had one idea about oh, we could build this out and we can put a unit over here. But his partner said, well, wait a minute. This is where the residents are on this side. Let's just landscape this. So there was a lot of sensitivity to exactly how the, the building would be rehabbed. So it's interesting that there is a possibility that this site could be developed by a private developer 
uh, with the inclusion of taking the gymnasium and rebuilding it for the town of Winthrop for the use for recreation. So it's one of the options that's out there. So I give you that before you make your comments. I'll open it up. Yes, Jack. Jack Dowd, Precinct 3. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Annifit Park is about four acres of land located on a bluff overlooking the Atlantic with spectacular views. Coughlin Park is about 10 acres, also with exceptional views. Both parklands would make prime development locations. I mention these parks because certain groups, boards, and committees are willing to sell a portion of, Ing of Ingleside Park. And that portion has yet to be determined. If the town council decides to sell Ingleside Park, are the remaining parks in jeopardy? The first town council was faced with a decision concerning the special development overlay district. The Darrimple School Building was allowed to go into this zoning change. Every councilor stated that this property would be the only property to ever qualify for this zoning change. That type of thinking quickly changed, and several more properties are now included in that zoning. If you open the door to sell public property to, to private developers, the same thing will happen. All open space in the town will be considered fair game. The information handed out at the front door describes Ingleside Park in detail. The land used to build the auditorium, gymnasium, and hockey rink was borrowed from Ingleside Park. It was stated at a planning board meeting that now that the buildings are not being used for school purposes, the land should revert back to residential use. It was never residential use. The land was given as a gift to be used as open space and parkland as described in the publication from 1902. It is the first park established by the town of Winthrop. The other handout is the EEA Article 97 land disposition policy. This is an amendment to the state constitution by the voters of Massachusetts in 1972. To be brief, this policy was written to prevent government from ill-considered misuse or other disposition of public lands and interest held for public use. The overriding point of Article 97 is to insulate dedicated parkland from short-term political pressures. After months of attending small meetings with various groups, I have not heard one mention of Article 97. In my research over the past year, I learned that there are many communities that use this policy as a guideline to figure out what to do with public land. Some of these cities and towns are Lowell, Wakefield, Westfield, and Brookline. There are many stipulations in this policy, the most concerning one being failure to comply with this policy renders the non-compliant municipality ineligible to receive EEA or EEA agency grants. Do not put the town, town's ability to obtain grant money in peril. Do not sell Ingleside Park. Thank you very much. Jack, I know you've been at just about every meeting that I have uh, had as town council president, specifically on this issue. And I think we told you that we were gonna do some homework on this and do some research. Well, today we found out that the property that we're talking about, this whole complex right here, was deeded from the Edward Cummings and Horace Cummings family in 18, uh, November 18th, 1872, to the town of Winthrop. So this particular site we found out today is indeed not on Ingleside Park. Yeah. 
seven point, where was it? 7.55 acres. Um, you already spoke, but you can speak a skill. She was a standing first, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, my name is Betsy Shane. I'm here to represent the Winthrop Chamber of Commerce to make a statement. The Winthrop Chamber of Commerce strongly encourages the redevelopment of the vacant middle school site, a mixed use project that remains compatible with the community's character would be tremendously beneficial to the community, as well as provide much needed tax revenue for the town. Vacant commercial sites negatively impact our community in many ways. This includes lower property values, reduced tax revenue, reduced income for our local businesses. Additionally, vacant residential and commercial property is an eyesore to the community. I don't think anyone who owns a commercial or a mixed-use property right now wants it sitting empty. A mixed-use project for the middle school site would provide and or improve our amenities as well as create a new tax source for the town. Over the past several years, many projects have seen to be great additions to the town. Vacant schools, a hospital, a nursing home, and businesses have been or are currently being transformed into new residential units and businesses for the betterment of the town. Town officials need to support the redevelopment of the Winthrop Middle School site in a swift and orderly manner. The chamber urges officials to streamline the process to turn this vacant site into new development Winthrop residents can be proud of and enjoy. Other projects in town have taken many years to complete, leaving neighbors living adjacent to unpleasant environments as well as reducing tax revenue desperately needed to improve the services for our residents. Ten years to redevelop a school or a hospital is not in the best interest of our community. The economic problems that we have now can be improved by smart growth and increased revenues. It's critical Winthrop changes the perception that redevelopment in our town is difficult and very time consuming. We should be encouraging developers to see Winthrop the way that we do who live here. It's a wonderful seaside community with potential to growth. We also want to make sure that any of the redevelopment is done with thoughtful, insightful looking and uh, making sure that the progress is in the correct time frame. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Daddy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was raised in an environment with my senior or my elders around me telling me it's a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I honestly believe that this property here has a tremendous amount of potential. I believe if the middle school is the parcel that is sold for housing development, and then moving on down toward Walden, leaving that because if I were coming in as a young married couple, or coming in wanting to purchase a home or a condo, I don't think I'd want to do it on the back end of a ball field. I wouldn't mind being up the street across from CVS, because that end of town with the, with the uh, ball field in the back, with the concerts that take place, with the uh, parking for the skating rink, and I think that that's a vital piece of property that we should maintain and continue to maintain as best we can. It represents something for the seniors, for the adults, for the youth. And I also believe the gymnasium can be modified so that it becomes a place for our youngsters to go after school to shoot a few baskets or to play. I think in this particular case, I'm not in favor of the housing and Option five, I am in favor of moving that all up toward the housing that's existing across from CVS and the school and up in that direction. I think it has a tremendous welcoming effect for potential purchase. I would uh, seriously ask whomever is in charge that uh, I have a quick question, if I may. Mr. Keller, Ingleside Park, does she flood anymore? She does. So best we not put the houses down in that neck of the woods. We put them up the hill a little bit. <laughs> That's all part of the infrastructure proposal? No. It's separate. Oh, it's separate. So you could get a developer to 
potentially buy the property at the school site and part of parcel of their purchase would be welcome to the town and you're going to help the infrastructure? Well, I hope you include that. But seriously, give it thought that that would be a tremendous opportunity for the town to maintain the skating rink, the parking where she is, because that's always busy, the ball field in the back, the concerts that take place, the gymnasium for our youth. The seniors have the senior center, so let's not get all hysterical. I don't mind doing yoga over there. I don't need to come down the center. Thank you, Dottie. I'll be, I'll be quick, because I already got up here. Steve Hines, Precinct 6 again. Um, hi. Ron, nobody in this world wants your plan passed on this site more than me right now. I'll tell you right now. Um, that being said, s take a step back, um, and I think a mixed-use approach is probably the best situation. I'd like to see so many units of housing on this side, so many of them. Um, but we need, I think that a commercial, a commercial aspect of this site is really important. Um, and unfortunately, when you're talking to a residential developer about building a site that's mixed use, you have to give height in order to get the commercial space downstairs. And so we can't, financially it doesn't work unless we go up four or five floors. You're right, that, that's, that's the give, that's the give. We have to, we have to balance these projects out. Um, so I'm all for repurposing the school as it is, as long as it makes sense, as long as there's a commercial element um, built into the site. Well, speaking of that, I guess I'll put this other one out there for you. This auditorium, this auditorium is the same size, if not bigger, than Lynn Auditorium. Does anybody go to Lynn Auditorium for concerts? Does anybody go to the Cabot Theater? I mean, if we think outside the box, this could be something that could be developed so that it's a home for the playmakers who are still alive and well, they're, 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 they're in existence, they just don't have a home. And this could be a potential site, this could be a anchor for them that they get certain amount of play during the year, but this also could be a source of income if we could get some type of a company to come in and run it for the town, the town could get income from it, but more importantly, what does it bring to the center? It brings people to go to a show, dinner before the show, dinner after the show, so you want commercial? There's a possibility. And incidentally, I had that discussion with the developer. And it's under consideration if they were, if we were to put an RFP out, it, it, anything could happen. I think we just need to think creatively. Any other questions or comments, I should say? Yes, Frank. Uh, very, good, very good comments, Ron, uh, about thinking outside the box and thinking about the uh, creative reuses of all of the properties that we have right now. Uh, relative to the plans that were shown here, however, uh, before I address uh, the very favorable possibility for option one, is that option five is uh, extremely intrusive and further nibbles away at what previously was 10 acres of land given by the Ingalls for Ingleside Park uh, in the, dra in the uh, drawing that uh, Jack Dowd provided with his uh, handouts uh, this evening. Uh, when the land, the Ingleside Park land was donated in 1902, uh, the area comprised 10 acres. That now has been nibbled away with various uh, improvements uh, and also some intrusion with Walden Street, uh, with the uh, hockey rink, with the, uh, some of the other tennis courts and what have you, so that the open space now would be maybe 60% or even 50% less of what it was originally. For, to go to option five, which was shown on screen, is, 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 would be an insult to the town, it seems to me, because it really, a half of that area is parking. We don't need any more parking. We certainly don't need any more cars in Winthrop, from my estimation. Uh, to speak to the uh, developer gentleman who just spoke and did speak earlier, I think that what was done on Pleasant Street is a remarkable asset for the town in the conversion of a former nursing facility that's turned into a, a positive uh, asset for the town. It's using the asset that we have here at the middle school that I think is very important. And the uh, opportunity for using this in creative ways to bring in the arts, to bring in culture, perhaps even to bring in uh, some of the many institutions that we have here in the Boston area that could utilize some of the classroom space as well that they could do dedicated study on marine biology, on environmental science, uh, and establish a uh, liaison with uh, MIT or Harvard or Northeastern or BU, I think would be a, a, another uh, possibility for the town to explore. 
But we, re we really need to use this kind of intelligent development and intelligent reuse of the existing facilities that we have and bring them up to a, uh, an acceptable par that they become uh, a part of the vitality of the community and attracts customers from out of town. Again, to bring, to bring them in to spend their dollars that they will leave with us and leave with a good experience. And then after, if this auditorium becomes a theater that you know, supplements this fantastic Shapiro Theater, a, a guy they used to play basketball with, as a matter of fact, and uh, is also the home base for our state championship drama club, by the way, two years running, I think you know, we, have, we have those kids wanting to go you know, to the next stage. If they had an opportunity to start you know, their own independent theater group, for example, you know, that could be a, a place like that. I mean, Garrison Keillor started in Minnesota you know, in, on the side of a barn, basically. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that if we had these facilities, uh, it would give a uh, wealth of opportunities to our younger, uh, our younger population, our, our kids and grandkids, and also would serve the, uh, the, the senior population. I think what it comes down to is having this kind of intelligent development and being able to reuse the school. And this doesn't really even address the issue uh, in, in thinking about this kind of development. I think a serious uh, consideration that really should be brought closer to the top of the, uh, the wish list is the, the need for a uh, combined fire station and police station facility, which this site would certainly provide in the center of town. But that's another question uh, for the council to consider. But option one certainly seems like a, uh, a much more viable and worthwhile and creative use of, the, uh, of, of that particular property. And I hope the town calls and moves in that direction with a developer that is favorable to that idea. Thank you. Mr. President, if I point of clarification. Just a point of clarification. And again, I'm not here to say option five should be pursued. But I want to be absolutely clear, option five stays within the footprint of the current buildings and grounds. So, Mr. Constantino, I appreciate all of your analysis on option one. That's fine. Option five, you're absolutely wrong. So it does stay within that. But again, we should look at all options and determine what's in the best interest of the town. But that was a piece of fake news. Okay, I'm <clears throat> Joe Clark, Precinct 1. Uh, we started off saying how financially upset we are because we don't have money for the first project, and then we go about we're putting in swimming pools, all the other stuff that maybe we really can't afford. Uh, there's been a study done in 1997 on the auditorium and gymnasium, and they said it was outdated in 1997. I don't think it improved since then. Uh, what do we waste our money for on these old buildings? They need to be torn down. Maybe you can do something with the <clears throat> school. I doubt it because a lot of people have already looked at it. I know one has come across and said they can do something. But what is the financial ramifications? We need to look at finance. This was supposed to be economic development, not a wish list. We were supposed to be improving the tax base of the town. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Mr. Lucero. So, Ron, I appreciate the meeting tonight. This is just rehashing something that we already went through a year ago. Four of the town councils here were at those meetings when Mr. Rizzioni, Mr. Aiello, Ms. Albagini presented a fantastic plan for this site. Just unbelievable. All the meetings that were had prior, everything that everybody wanted, a, a pool, a community center, some housing, all included. This should be the plan to move forward with. I don't want you to beat this to death and have another decade before this thing is developed. It needs to be a plan in place as soon as possible and let's move forward. You need to use Mr. Aiello, Ms. Albagini's expertise in this. They know how to get grant money. They know how to develop things. You need to listen to them and move forward with their plan, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rob. Uh, Rob DeMarco, Precinct 6. Um, you know, I think it's, first off, I think it's great having everybody here. I mean, everybody's here because we love Winthrop. And uh, thank you very much uh, for having us all here. Um, one thing I see about the middle school site is we have a lot of different options, and we have a lot of different ways to look at it, especially when it comes to the residential areas. Um, I've also heard about, you know, the school systems and the capacity of the school systems and how much young, how many more kids would that bring into the school system? And I, 
I thank Mike and, and, and Steve for pointing out with Seal Harbor, you know, there's only one child that's come in, so you can actually increase tax revenue without actually adding to the capacity of the schools. But with all these different options, I'm looking at it and thinking that, you know, the people that live at Seal Harbor who might be on the upper end of the age range for the most part, versus the people who would live in the center of town walking to our restaurants, walking down the center. Um, I don't know if there's been any studies based on any plans on what kind of units would bring in what kind of people, whether that be townhouses, whether that be apartments. Have there been any studies into, or any, any have we looked at like what kind of houses are we gonna have and what kind of people are they gonna attract? It's a good question. I mean, we can go by what's happening up on Pleasant Street, you mentioned earlier. Any further comment? No, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Yes, ma'am. Christine, Christine Bernstein, Precinct 6. Um, it was mentioned about the police and fire station. Are there any plans for a new police and fire station? I know there's been some conversation and it's needed. And if that is to happen, if it's not part of this project, where would that go? I'll call on my chief, who's walking down. And he's, he can give us an update of the whole process, because it is going through a process right now. And uh, Chief Flanagan, maybe you can give us just a brief update of where everything stands. Well, we had a meeting with the uh, architects for, to do a feasibility study for a public safety building as well as uh, repair the police station and do a fire station. <clears throat> I've heard about our elderly rink being almost 40 years old. My stations are 128 years old, and my beach firehouse is uh, four years newer and at a cost to the town for the two buildings together of $22,000. We are not in competition for this site. Um, I'm a true townie. When I go away to Florida, I always uh, let a sigh of relief when I get back over the Belle Isle Bridge to make my wife very unhappy. But with that, I want what's best for the town for this site, but by no uncertain terms, I have to let the taxpayers know, you know, taxpayers were very concerned that a firehouse must be built because as we talk about resiliency, sea level rise and everything else, it's public safety that has to respond to these places. And our buildings in 1969 were deemed not fit. We continue to use them. The firefighters keep the living space uh, livable, if you will, but the structures are literally coming apart at the seams. So all I want to do is I want the community to do what's best for us as a community, but please keep in your minds you will be addressing a public safety or a firehouse in the near future. So as we build a new skating rink, which did have a roughly, I think, eight years ago, had over a million dollars put into it, um, <clears throat> it's not quite 40 years old and falling down, and I'm not in competition with the rink, but as we talk swimming pools and you know, being a, a homeowner, we often talk about how do, how do our friends, how does that other couple we go out with get in financial problems? They go out and they buy cars, they, they go on too many vacations. From a public safety perspective, I don't know if we're quite ready yet for swimming pools and things like that. We have beautiful school buildings. When French Square was done over by Mr. Constantino, I was a kid, I was giddy about that. That was the first thing that was ever done. The town's been cleaned up, the fire department's time is coming, but truly what is happening, we will be in trailers housing our apparatus somewhere. The buildings just can't do it. Down my beach firehouse, I have a generator I took from the Cliff House nursing home. That's 1969, we wired it in and it's working. These buildings have to be able to operate for you folks. We're not in competition of the development, I think it's great, I love the town, I'm gonna retire here. But right now, the public safety community, we are in urgent need of a building. We're open 365 days a year. When it snows and all these beautiful buildings close, we'll be open. Please give us something that works in those days. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Flanagan. And just to clear the air, I'm not in any competition for any particular design. I just want you to know that, Joe. I, 
uh, we're here tonight to throw everything out there at you and just get some input, okay? Um, with that, yes, Jack, go ahead, real quick. I will be quick. I did a lot of research for my statement, and I was refuted by your saying that you had a deed for the property of Ingleside Park. I'm going to get a whole copy for this for you tomorrow. Well, it was not fair to unearth this uh, miracle of finding this deed on the eve of uh, such a large gathering. Uh, it just so happened. It was, I got it today. That's I, don't have, I don't have a copy. I'll get you a copy. So, so your copy of the deed uh, entails the... I'll give you the complete report. 13 acres of, of uh, land that is now Ingleside Park? No, no. It has nothing to do with Ingleside Park. It, it, clears, it, it clearly disputes that the, the land is on Ingleside Park. So we'll get you a copy of everything. I'll have it done, and I'll, I'll send it over to your house tomorrow. Okay? Yes, sir. Hi, I'll be very brief. Uh, Dick Lawton, Precinct 2, and full disclosure, I am on the committee with Joe and Lisa and Mike on the rink study. Uh, but my outlook is just to help get whatever they choose built. Uh, but I do want to point out one thing. When we started here in this building, I think it was 2012, at that point, everybody knew that building was going to be abandoned. Six years later, we're still talking about it. Thank you. That's why we're here tonight, buddy. Because we own it now. So that's why we're here. Thank you. Yeah. One uh, quick question, then we're going to get to the prairie. Just on the point of abandoned buildings, I just want to remind everybody that the hospital structures were uh, unresolved as far as the proper use for about 10 years, and I know in, maybe even more. And the planning board went through back and forth and went through lots of hoops with developers that had bought the property, then they sold it off, somebody else came in. But what had happened is that the right kind of development and the right kind of developer came in to make the beautiful arbors that are used in the hospital property right now. And I think that's the kind of you know, creative direction that the town council needs to explore with the, 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 uh, either within their own committees or with consultants that come in to be able to find that right kind of use for the, uh, for the center district and the middle school property. So just remember that we do have a precedent here and we want to do the right thing and make it successful for everybody in town. Thank you. There's no more comments. Comments from the council? Just on, um, you know, I, I've heard a few comments tonight on, thank you. I've heard a few comments tonight on the effects of the school population with any residents that we end up doing. And I think, I'm not sure if it was Stephen that made the comment about the Sail Harbor and how there's only one uh, school child in Sail Harbor. And, I don't want to say that the demographics of Seal Harbor are elderly. I'll say there may be a lot of um, empty nesters that, although there might not be a lot of children in Seal Harbor, there are a lot of Winthrop residences who were maybe empty nesters who wanted to downsize, to move to a different type of environment, moved to Seal Harbor, and a lot of families moved into town and bought those houses. So there are indirect challenges that we need to look at in terms of how, um, how many units are built that could affect our school population. Um, I do think the project on Pleasant Street was built in a way, and Steve might be able to address this even better, but the demographics were a little bit different. And if you look at the people that have purchased units, they're people from different states, different, you know, different backgrounds that may be more the millennial type people that um, don't, aren't disturbing the house population that we have now, um, because that is something that we have to look at. We have three beautiful new school buildings, but we do have three, and, um, and they're pretty close to maxed out now, so we, you want to be careful that it might not be the units, but it might be who might be buying the units, and the properties that are being purchased from that. So I just want people to be aware of that. Even though there's one student from Sail Harbor, Sail Harbor generated a lot of, um, a lot more school, a lot more population to our schools. Thank you, Councilor. Chief. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do the ferry presentation 
And in fairness, um, I have Tangi Safuni here as well that can probably speak more to the history of it if anyone had a histor historical question. Uh, but I've concentrated on the finance portion of, of the ferry. Um, it is something that I've gone on with my children and my family over to Boston. Uh, we've enjoyed it. I think it brings a certain asset to Winthrop that we always didn't have. Uh, I think like much else tonight, we're discussing uh, what we can afford uh, and what the town's people want to see in the next year's budget and, and perhaps what they don't want to see in next year's budget. Um, so without further ado, I, uh, we broke it down in fiscal years. The ferry is a very complicated budget process uh, because we normally start it in, in the prior fiscal year and it runs into the following fiscal year. So you're really um, coming over two fiscal years. So to break down the money as best we could, uh, we looked at what subsidies um, what was last year's budget was $419,000. We looked at what subsidies we received um, you know, last year. Uh, it was a $100,000 subsidy uh, for the general fund uh, that the council voted on. A 75,000 mass dot and a $150,000 subsidy that um, hasn't been received yet, but we have gotten great news this week that we're about to receive it. DEP will pay it in arrears and they will not pay it, in the, uh, pay it forward. Much, many grants are in that nature. Uh, so Joe Domalovers has been on the phone with TNG today and, and last week trying to get that 150 released. Um, the town projected 155,000 in ticket sales, uh, really came in at $66,258.26. Uh, so we didn't meet those projections. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the Quincy um, not really being ready until after July where we, we planned on getting those revenues a lot earlier um, on those ticket sales out of Quincy. Uh, so it leaves us a, a balance of $27,000. If we get the 150 uh, from the EP, it will pick up the deficit of $27,000 for this year. Uh, next year's budget, and this has not been approved, this is not have, has not been approved, uh, this is a submitted budget. I apologize for that. I, well, I think it, it timed out up there. So um, <laughs> I'll go through it because I don't know how to, how to operate this. I'm not sure if Mike does or doesn't know. He's saying no to me. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw it up online tomorrow. So the personnel services was $220,000. Um, that was a submitted budget. Purchase services was $212,000. Um, <clears> the grants that we're expecting in is 150 from DEP and MassDOT, we have um, changed that billing procedure from 75,000 last year uh, to our request of 162,000 this year to operate the ferry service from Quincy to Boston. Uh, we did a real time analysis on what it costs us to go to Quincy and from Quincy to Boston and how many trips a day we do. And that $75,000, we were actually losing a lot of money. Uh, it's actually $162,000. So it, we're still talking with um, Mass dot, and you know they want to know who keeps the ticket sales. Then, well, if they give us one hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars, they have a right to keep those ticket sales because they're prepaying me for the tickets. Um, so they have a right to have that deduction. I feel because they're paying me for the full service, and whether I pick up two people or I pick up seventy-five people, uh, I'm getting paid for the full service of that boat at that particular time. Um, so the remaining balance of the budget. Um, after those two grants is $134,000. We did raise the projection of our ticket sales this year to $104,000, and that was because we're starting a lot earlier. Uh, the pleasure cruises, the sunset cruises, as we did last year, sold out. Uh, every single uh, night that we had them, there was a sellout on the boat. Um, we were going to start those earlier this year, but also going to service Quincy with those sunset cruises on a specific night. Winthrop will get a specific night, and the seaport uh, district will get us a, a certain night as well. So we think we can make up uh, revenue by having those um, additional sunset cruises. Um, that does leave us still $22,000 shot. Um, a lot of money I added to the ferry budget this year um, to take into all the expenses that wasn't, they was allocated to other general fund line items. Um, some of it, you know, 9,000 of the 22 is uh, capital expenses for repairs and, and whatnot. So that's potential money of if we don't spend all the capital money um, to put back into the budget. Uh, but also, um, there's a harbor master 
that also captains our boat. His money came out last year. A lot of ways I transferred that to, to the ferry at this particular point in time. Um, that can be backed out as well to, to balance this budget. So I just wanted to be uh, fair that the council has not voted this budget for 19. Um, we have to start operating because we have commitments and guarantees. I do think if we can get MassDOT and DEP to fully fund our, our initiative, it is well worth keeping um, operating because I do think the biggest value we get here in Winthrop uh, as residents are those sunset cruises. I'm not a big commuter. I don't have to leave the town gratefully for that. Um, but I certainly do I like the enjoyment aspect of taking my children out on the ferry. Um, so with that, I will open it up for comments. Uh, Tangi, if you had anything you wanted to add. Prior to that, please. Um, I just wanted to add that during the um, commuting hours, um, both in the morning and the evenings, we are reducing the rate for commuters down to $2. Yeah. We are reducing the parking um, and we are down to $6 rate versus a $8 rate. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, the commuting hours in the morning leaving and the commuting hours coming back, those rates will now be $6 one way versus $8.50 one way that we had in the past. We're hoping this will um, attract more people to use the ferry. Um, it's pretty much compatible to taking the bus and then getting on to the train. Um, we're in really positive, um, we're having very positive conversations with the Mass Department of Transportation and the MBTA. They are going to do a big push on marketing this on the red lines, um, on their websites. Um, they've promised that uh, to us as well. And um, they are upgrading their Charlie system, and hopefully that will be rolled out in the next year or two. And they would consider um, incorporating um, ferry services, including ours, into the Charlie card system. So those are discussions that we're also having. Um, just recently, we've been able to um, finalize an agreement with the New England Aquarium. So now we will be docking our ferry there at no cost. So we'll be saving us $14,000 a year because that's what we were being charged to go to Rose Wharf. Um, so that's, that cost has been eliminated. So um, we are partnering with, um, with the state and, um, and the city of Quincy and the seaport has completely embraced us. We currently are the only ferry service going to the seaport. So um, they have embraced us. They have continued to market us and, and showcase us last July and, and are intending to do that again for us this year. One. Okay, all right, that's a good question, but the, re the reason why they're doing that is because they are considering subsidizing us because they have two train stations going down at, in Quincy, and so th that's the red line to go from Quincy into Boston. So another mode of transportation that they're offering is the ferry, or Winthrop Ferry. So they are actually shutting down 500 parking spaces, and they are going to reroute those parking spaces down to the Squantum Point Park. And so people will have an option of either getting on our ferry to go to Boston or, t or getting on a shuttle to go to another train station. So the, so the reason why they would be marketing over at the red line is instead of getting on the red line, you can take, our, you can take the shuttle, go, or you can go park down at Squantum Point and take the ferry into Boston. So it's part of their guaranteed mitigation to the city of Quincy uh, that they would contract with us um, to offset our expenses on the boat as well. Right. Um, I, I agree. Um, I, a couple of years ago, we did invest um, about $12,000. I mean, we had bought, um, we had a vinyl uh, billboard printed out, and we were up on the billboard on Route 1 uh, for about three months. Um, you know, we also you know, use social media a lot. I didn't have a big budget. Um, you know, I think this year, 
We're going to be using social media again. We're going to try to do some press releases, get in local newspapers and the Heralds. Uh, you know, we've been recognized in the Boston Business Journal. Um, I've reached out to him again. He's willing to do another story on us. Uh, when I was speak speaking to Mass Department Transportation today, we want to do little blurbs to get on all the local stations um, that our ferry service that's, gonna, that's operated by the town of Winthrop will be partnering with Mass Department of Transportation. And if we could just get like a little 20 second blurb out on all our local stations, that would be great. I don't have a huge budget to do a lot of marketing. Um, I, I believe in word of mouth. I believe in an excellent customer service. Um, and we've done an excellent job arriving and departing on time, making our customers happy, listening to what our customers are wanting. Um, now partnering with the Mass Department of Transportation um, and DEP will allow us to bring down our commuting rates because that is something that people have said that they want us to do. Um, we are going to the aquarium. We're going to the seaport. Uh, we are going to go back out to the Boston Harbor Islands this year uh, uh, on a Wednesday afternoon and once during the weekends. Um, so, you know, eventually we would love to have in our operating budget a marketing line item for the town of Winthrop. We would love to brand ourselves. Um, you know, obviously, just like everybody has been mentioning, we have to define on who we want to be and how we're going to market that and incorporate the ferry into that. So... That's our plan. And we have been working with the mayor in Revere to get advertisements out in their hotels in Revere uh, as well. He's been very open to uh, discussion as we yeah. move forward to the spring. Yeah, we'd like to meet with a lot of those local developers. And last year, we did have a local resident who offered her time. She put together a two-minute video of the ferry and of Winthrop for us um, at no cost. And then she also put a 20-second video highlighting the ferry and the town of Winthrop. And the seaport has used that video and they, they, they'll show it in their elevators, um, they'll like project it, and um, they've also marketed it down in their concierge areas around the seaport. Hi, um, Dawn Manning, Precinct 3. So, um, Ms. Sufini, when you say um, marketing and you mean like social media, you mean like Facebook, you run the site for um, the ferry on Facebook. Is that what you mean by you? So, yes. I mean, we don't do a lot on Facebook, but we do try to push the... Um, we do try to push the, ca the, the schedule out there. We use the town manager's blog, um, which we have about 3,000 subscribers to get stuff out there. Um, you know, obviously the city of Quincy has a lot more followers because they're a larger city. So they have a whole website and a Facebook page as well. And so does the Seaport. Okay, because I want you to realize that you have me personally blocked on Facebook, so I cannot get any ferry information, and I have discussed that with the town manager, so when I try to pull things up, which I don't care that you have me personally blocked on Facebook, my issue is that I can't receive any ferry information, and that's an infringement on um, my first rights, uh, on my amendments, on my first amendment rights, um, so... So that happens to be my issue when I'm trying to find ferry information. Um, and I have, you know, and I can prove that as long as you don't go to your phone right now, I can gladly take up my phone, show the town manager, show anybody in the council, or gladly on WCAT. And there's plenty of people that are at home watching because they, if they go on the Winthrop Town Ferry site and try to get information and they can't see your name answering questions, but can see comments, but you're not see your name, that means you have them personally blocked, which is not an issue, but as a town employee, that's an abuse of your power. So if you want to personally block me on Facebook, all for it, but when I'm trying to get information on the ferry site and I can't, I have a huge issue with that. That is an infringement on my First Amendment. I did speak to you a couple times, and I'm still blocked. Don, we'll get you unblocked. Yeah, I, I don't care if she blocks me. Personally. I'll get you unblocked. I'm not the only person in Winthrop that cannot see the ferry site, and it's an abuse of. We'll review it. We'll take a look at it. Okay. 
Thank you. Any other comments? You, I, I'll be two seconds. Um, Steve Hines, Precinct 6 again. Um, I was a founding member of the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, for the town of Winthrop, and um, one of our first charges was to, to dive as deep as we could in the ferry with what McKenna would, would give us at the time, which wasn't much. Um, but I will say, um, you know, I'm impressed with all that you know about the ferry and all, all the work you've done in the ferry, but it blows my mind, it's like insanity to me, that we have somebody who knows this much about a ferry and we don't have a town planner to tell us how to build buildings. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me to be allocating, um, especially the human resources funding. The ferry is one thing, but for the employees that take the staff that, we could have an entire planning department. Um, in the town of Winthrop, um, and that would be economic development, which is exactly the mission that the ferry was supposed to was supposed to bring to life. Um, so my suggestion would be to reallocate all of the resources from the ferry into a planning department and, and, and get some gas in the ass of this town on development rather than a waste of a boat. I don't know. Any other comments? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, you introduce I yourself. I, I, my name no, is Frank like Costantino kidding. again. <laughs> Precinct 2, uh, and I do want to uh, thank the uh, town council for their patience in listening to all of this and hopefully absorbing it. Uh, Ron Vecchi of setting it up in his venue, uh, Terry and Denise and Joe and Steve Keller is left to clear snow away or something. But anyway, um, I want to uh, address the fact that yes, there, there needs to be a, uh, a reweighting of some of the uh, important priorities that the town has to address because we have a wonderful ferry and it's terrific that, it's, uh, that we have that addition and that service to the town. It provides exceptional, uh, exceptional travel to Boston but the fact is that we bring people into Boston, but who comes here and spends their money? Why is it, that, what is it that uh, is gonna bring people into Winthrop? What can we do that, that emphasizes the, our seaside community, the beaches that we have? Uh, some suggestions were made uh, to a, uh, from a, an old beautification committee member that put together a pretty comprehensive uh, outline of possibilities, and it's online at, uh, uh, and I'll uh, provide that to anyone that uh, would like to uh, know about that. Um, and. But the point is, is that uh, you know we could do some some simple things that wouldn't be that would be cost effective, wouldn't uh, entail a lot of money. But we need to provide a reason for all of the advertising that we're doing in Boston and surrounding communities. We have we have uh, uh, big photo montages at terminals at Logan Airport. What do people want to come to Winthrop for? If they want to go to the beach, you know, how come we don't have restrooms at at Winter, at the Winter Beach and Euro Beach? Okay, they would be seasonally mobile, but we should have something like that. We should have uh, seasonal and mobile paddleboard or kayak rental companies at the beaches and at the town landing when they get off the ferry. Uh, we should have uh, paddleboard and kayaking tours from the town landing to Belle Isle Marsh and Crystal Cove, stuff that would take advantage of the protected harbor that we have in and around the uh, Crystal Cove area. We should permit food trucks near all the beaches and have them in force and bring them in from Boston. They're all over the Greenway. We know they're there. Well, it's short money. They, they, if they see an economic opportunity and we want to bring people in on the ferry and we have boatloads like we see from Jaws, right, you know, going down to the island, we want to have people coming in and having a good time in Winthrop. But we can do things in a creative way in a short way to be able to make that happen. And we want to promote more, uh, vest more festivals of various kinds that would be uh, bringing people into town. I mean, that's the way that we can use the ferry as a way to bring people in to spend their money. Uh, again, I want to thank all of the uh, councilors and for this uh, opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. All right, Kurt Millar, Precinct 2. Um, I got a couple of things I want to tie in together, which is part of the ferry also. So how many years do we run a business in the red? That's one big question I have because I know, you know, I have a DJ company that I run. If I were to ever run it so many years in the red, I'm losing money and I'm not going to get it back. But I'll keep investing into it and continue to lose money in hopes that the business will make money. You know, in business, you do take the risk. But how long do you take that risk before you just finally say, it's a loss, it's not working. Maybe in the future, we can do it again or try it again. Right now, it's taking money where it's needed, taking money from where it's needed. Um, you know, Chief said that, you know, we need a, a building for them. We do. We absolutely do. Um, tying in everything else, I... I 
I want a Lamborghini. I love them, right? I probably could afford a Corvette, but in reality, I had to get a truck, okay? We overspend in this town. We put money into things that are not worthwhile to put money into when we have needs, definite needs. Our infrastructure, yes, it needs to be done. Do we have to spend an extra 700000 on landscaping that hmm, we haven't budgeted for long term to say, what's the maintenance cost on all this landscaping? Who's paying for it? Is it going to be the business? Is it going to be the town? Is it going to be the taxpayers? Who's paying for all this long term? I see a lot of stuff going on in this town, this school building alone, where long term things are not put into any kind of budget. Uh, football field. My biggest concern and why I was going to vote no for it was because there was no maintenance plan for it. My line of work, my full-time job, that's all I do is look at long-term things. I'm a startup leader on projects, multi-million dollar projects, and I have to think outside the box and say, okay, what are the parts on these machines going to cost me in five, ten years? We don't look at that. We're like, oh, we want this. Let's get it. We put it in place and come back to the taxpayers and say, hey, now we're going to add more money to it. So those, those are certain aspects of like this whole center business district and everything. I'm dead set against any building going up four stories. I think it's a horrible idea. Um, but the long-term effects of what we're trying to quickly get done. And another quick point on the ferry, sounds like we already have it set that we want to do it for going forward for the next year. I don't think that's a good idea. Thank you. Any further comment on the ferry? No? Comments from my fellow counselors? I'm going to open it up to general comments. OK, I'll open it up to any comment you'd like to make to the council. Hearing none, I thank you very much for attending tonight, and thank my counselors for uh, their attention this evening. Motion. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? All opposed?